my recording is good. Owen, are you ready with the opening? Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Education. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. That is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We're ready to begin. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Council Member Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee, and I'd like to welcome you to today's virtual hearing on examining social emotional learning in support staff in schools. Today, we're discussing this critical issue in the context of a public health crisis. However, to understand how much work New York City's Department of Education needs to do, we must understand where we were before we got here. I've said this many times before COVID-19, and I'm going to keep saying it until we get this right. DOE, historically, and up to this point, continues to fall short to meet the social, emotional well-being of our students. In an education system of 1.1 million students, DOE employed just 1,533 social workers, 2,992 guidance counselors during the 2019-20 school year, while the American School Counselor Association recommends a school counselor to student ratio of one to 250. Last school year, at least 1,037 DOE schools had a ratio above this recommendation. Furthermore, more than 1,200 DOE schools had a social worker to student ratio above the National Association of Social Work recommendation of one to 250. With these discrepancies well before this current crisis, the council, advocates, teachers, students, and parents support for more social emotional supports in schools. I would like to say that the administration worked with us, particularly this council, to add in the last budget uh, 200 new full-time social workers. And in this latest budget, it was a very hard battle, battle that still sits fresh for many of us when 25 of those social worker positions were in jeopardy and the council had to fight very hard to, to keep every one of those positions, which we were able to do. We also fought very hard to fight back against a proposed $100 million fair student funding cut, which would have devastated school communities and led to the loss of counselors, teachers, social workers. We fought back and we also helped fight back uh, to keep the single shepherd program, uh, which provides counselors and social workers to schools in central Brooklyn and South Bronx, but we know we have so much more work to do. I have to say that with, with all that I just shared, um, we are nowhere near where we need to be. Further, I must acknowledge my disappointment that during this pandemic, a moment in which we should be increasing social emotional supports for students, you know, many of us still had to kind of go through these battles to save critical programs that really are the lifeline safe net for kids. And that also includes programs such as community schools, learning to work and others. They're all a part of our student social safety net, which we have to protect. The challenges our students are, are facing are daunting. The National Center for Biotechnology Information reports that isolation Social distancing mandates and economic shutdowns could have had a devastating impact on the mental health of young people, including increasing their anxiety and reducing their opportunities to manage stress. Research also shows that the mere closing closure of school buildings can negatively affect the well being of students, especially since schools serve as the de facto mental health system for students. So many may be missing out on important social emotional supports due to school closures. Beyond the research, Anecdotally, I've been learning about the impact COVID-19 has been having on our city students. School leaders have informed me that they've discovered through wellness calls that domestic violence cases may be increasing. Students are going hungry, particularly in need of hot meals, and families are stressed out about remote learning. All of these issues have a social emotional impact on, on students. I also want to add that a number of our students have taken on increased responsibilities and tasks since the pandemic. Many high school students have now become essential workers working 
in food stores, grocery stores to help their parents and families pay rent. And they had no choice but to opt for full remote. And a decision that I disagree with, with the department, um, they did not allow students who opted for remote in high school to receive a Metro card, even if, even if they were eligible to receive one. And that has a severe impact on, on that family. Um, many of these students don't have a choice. They had to pick full remote. There, many of them are working right now. And now we've added an, an added burden, an added cost to, to, them, to them and to their families. Also, I've heard from high school principals where their students are not in receipt of, of, tech, of adequate internet, where they have to travel to a space to get a Wi-Fi signal. But that travel cost is out of their own pocket. So that's something that we could fix immediately by just granting, initialing them their Metro cards, which they rightfully deserve. I, um, as mentioned, uh, many of our schools still are not equipped with enough guidance counselors or social workers to support many of our kids who are experiencing a whole host of trauma and challenges. Um, I understand that DOE has developed many pandemic programs, including creating a bridge to school program, providing teachers with trauma-informed professional development and offering targeted mental health supports for students. This hearing will provide the opportunity for the committee to examine these programs and DOE's effectiveness in supporting the social emotional well-being of kids. I'm interested in, in, in how DOE is connecting students to services. What are some of the most critical issues coming up during wellness calls? And what is DOE doing to effectively address such issues? And also not penalizing students if they're not able to log on to internet and, and to devices and marking them absent, which leads to uh, unwarranted and unjust calls to ACS. It is not the parents and families fault that the DOE in the city has not given them internet service. And I know that the DOE recently changed their policy and approach where they still have to call parents first. But what happens during the call, the family shares, I don't have internet, I don't have a device. What then? It's, you know, it's, New York City had over half a year to get this right. Every child from every zip code should have a device and rival internet at this point. And that is not the case, including children in shelter who still cannot connect to a Wi-Fi signal. They knew this, they knew this. Uh, I, I, I just feel that I have to say, the impacts our kids are experiencing, they're no longer temporary. These impacts are generational. We, we have to get this right. We have to, uh, we have to act with a sense of urgency and not kick things down the road and be in denial because I, I, I fault City Hall and the mayor responsibly for being in denial that has cost our students and, and our school communities precious time that they'll never get back. Uh, I want to uh, thank everyone who is testifying today. And I want to thank the city council staff for all the work that they put into today's hearing. Malcolm Butehorn, Jen Atwell, Kalima Johnson, Chelsea Bettymore, Macy uh, Sarkissian. I also want to thank my chief of staff and escape and my policy director uh, Vanessa uh, Ogle, and I'll just note uh, the members who are here with us uh, this morning. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Barron, Councilmember uh, Levine, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Gredenchik, Councilmember Lewis, and Councilmember uh, Borelli. Um, and with that, I will turn it now over to the administration to testify. Thank you, Chan. And we've also just been joined by Councilmember Lander. Thank you, Chair Traga. I am Kalima Johnson, Senior Legislative Policy Analyst to the Committee on Education of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you'll be unmuted. I will be calling, calling on witnesses to testify in panels. So please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, while you will be placed on a panel, I will be calling individuals to testify one at a time. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on in the order with which 
your hand is raised after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please note that for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing for a second round of questioning. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move on to the next panelist. Please listen carefully and wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Lauren Siciliano, Chief Administrative Officer, Lawrence Pendergast, Deputy Chief Academic Officer, Mark Ramberson, Senior Executive Director, Christopher Caruso, Senior Executive, Kenyatta Reed, Executive Director, and Elizabeth Strenzel, Director of Policy. I will, read, I will first read the oath and after I will call on each panelist here from the administration individually to respond. First, I'll call on Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robertson. Deputy Chancellor, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to CM questions? Can we please unmute Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson? Yes, I do. Thank you. Lauren Siciliano, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Lawrence Pendergast, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Mark Ramberson, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Christopher Caruso, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Can Kenyatta Reed, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. And finally, Elizabeth Strenzel, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you all. Deputy Chancellor Robinson, you may begin when ready. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee. It is a pleasure to be here this morning to talk about a topic that is vital to the New York City Department of Education, the social and emotional well-being of our children. I am LaShawn Robinson, the Deputy Chancellor for School Climate and Wellness at the DOE, which is a position and the vision created by Chancellor Carranza three years ago with the specific intent of making supportive and welcoming school environments for our students a top priority. I would like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Traeger, and the City Council for your strong support and interest in what I know to be some of the most important work of the New York City Department of Education. You should know that even though we had to close our school buildings earlier this week out, out of an abundance of caution, the social and emotional well being of all our students have remained a central focus of the DOE throughout the COVID 19 pandemic. It is deeply embedded 
and all of the remote learning work we are doing, as well as the connections we established with students who attended in person during the first weeks of this school year. And it will remain so throughout this school year, including when we reopen our building, hopefully in the near future. All of our social emotional learning and supportive environment work is organized through what we call a multi-tiered system of support or MTSS. MTSS refers to the idea that everyone requires a foundational level of support. That's called tier one. That is universal and it's intended for all students. Of course, we know some students need additional small group or individual support on top of that, which we call tier two and tier three. For students who need even more intensive tier three services, we may provide individual counseling, an intervention plan, or a referral to an outside mental health provider. Schools use their relationships with students and families, as well as data to determine when students require additional support and whether a student is making adequate progress after a given intervention. The pandemic has made clearer than ever why supportive school environments are so important. We know that our students, families, and educators have experienced significant trauma over the past year, including abrupt separation from their school support system, loss of teachers and loved ones, fear and anxiety about their health and safety, and so much more than that. And Chair Craig has described some of those challenges. At the same time, we have also seen tremendous resilience. We are amazed at the ways our communities have worked together, supported one another, and persisted despite tremendous obstacles. Now that school buildings have closed, hopefully for just a short period, we remain committed committed to building resilience through wellness and strong school communities. Back in the spring when we transitioned to remote learning, my team immediately began thinking about both remote learning support strategies, as well as how to prepare to welcome students back in a way that reminded them that school is a place where they are safe, where they are welcome and where they are supported. We started offering staff training in Crisis and Trauma 101 immediately. That's a professional development series focused on crisis response, grief and loss, bereavement, and self-care in a crisis. This included school crisis team members responsible for addressing crises who implemented the school's crisis intervention plan and provided supports to the school community. We also facilitated social emotional learning sessions called Support the Supporter that built adult capacity to nurture their own wellness. These trainings continued throughout the spring and summer for over 13,000 staff members, including crisis team members and administrators. These practices were put into immediate use across the system during remote learning and of course benefited students, families, and staff members who experienced losses this spring. Over the summer, we built further on that training using philanthropic support and funding to start the school-wide trauma-responsive educational practices, or TREP. TREP, which all school leaders completed this summer and will continue to roll out to all school-based staff, enables educators to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma and its impact on young people. The TREP training also includes effective classrooms and school-wide trauma care practices consistent with existing social, emotional, and mental health support system used in the DOE. These trainings were implemented in conjunction with our Bridge to School plan. Bridge to School, is a guide we provided to schools to help them focus on supporting the social and emotional well-being and resiliency of students by integrating 
social emotional support with academic content. It is especially focused on the opening days and weeks of the school year when it is most important to make students see school as nurturing, supportive, supportive and a safe space. Given the trauma our students faced during the pandemic, it was a priority for me during the most recent budget to maintain our level of direct in-school social and emotional support for students. This includes the school response clinicians and many of our other social worker programs, including bridging the gap social workers for schools with high populations of students in temporary housing, our single shepherds, and our new high need social workers. Hundreds of social workers were added to our schools over the past few years, thanks to the council and in particular, Chair Traeger. I am pleased that we were able to maintain these positions and to ensure every student has access to a guidance counselor or social worker, even in these difficult budget circumstances. I want to thank the council again and in particular you, Chair Trigger, for your essential support and your continued advocacy. Even in the difficult financial circumstances caused by the pandemic, we continue to find ways to provide critical services for our most vulnerable students, students in temporary housing and foster care face especially acute challenges as a result of COVID-19 and the shift to remote learning. More than 300 field-based staff supporting students in temporary housing have been equipped with resources and skills to support the mental health of students and families, including a specific focus on trauma-informed care and restorative approaches. Bridging the Gap social workers provide teletherapy and remote counseling to students in temporary housing. Field-based staff are also conducting wellness check-ins with students in temporary housing to ensure they are accessing self-support and connecting to remote learning. Additionally, a few weeks ago, we announced two support programs targeted specifically at schools and the neighborhoods in our city's hardest hit communities by COVID-19. One is a new partnership with New York City Health and Hospitals that helps connect our students to a variety of services, including outpatient mental health clinics where children and adolescents can receive ongoing therapy, psychiatric evaluation, medication management, and other clinical services. Excuse me. The second is our School Mental Health Specialist Program, formerly known as the School Mental Health Consultant Program. It has been designed or redesigned to focus on those neighborhoods with greatest needs and to provide more direct services to students. As you know, this program is funded through Thrive NYC and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and we are deeply grateful for their support as well as the additional assistance we are now receiving through this partnership. We are so fortunate to have partners in government who work with us to find creative ways to support our children in this time of crisis. To support adult mental health, DOE employees have access to supportive services through the Employee Assistance Program and NYC Well. Free confidential mental health services are available from NYC Well in over 200 languages and can be accessed through text or phone calls. Of course, mental health supports available prior to the pandemic, like our school-based mental health clinics also remain in place. Under this chancellor, and with the support of this council, we have been investing in the social emotional well being of our students well before the pandemic. For example, in June of 2019, the, the Division of School Climate and Wellness announced our Resilient Kids Safe Schools package. That was a major effort designed to expand key initiatives and programming, like our centrally funded restorative justice programming which is now featured in about 500 of our high schools and middle schools. At the elementary school level, the package included centrally funded trainings and curricula for social emotional learning, established in partnership with Stanford Harmony to roll out to all elementary schools in three years. This school year marks the second year of that rollout 
And I'm pleased to say that we are still on track for our universal goal, even with the complications caused by the pandemic. Through our partnership with Thrive NYC, we also establish our school response clinicians or SRCs who are social workers specially trained in crisis response and management who provided services for students in need of specialized support in approximately 300 middle and high schools. I cannot emphasize enough how powerful this initiative proved to be this spring as COVID-19 hit the city and SRCs enabled our students to remotely access the support they needed more than ever. The SRCs continue to be one of our most valuable resources I also want to acknowledge that all of our cell and trauma-informed work is rooted in our commitment to a culturally responsive sustaining environment and the priority of advancing equity now. Our Bridge to School plan has activities that honor students' identities and live experiences. Our schools know our students best and all of the work I have described is intended to ensure that schools have access to resources they need to support students, to give them strategies and tools they can use in real time. The Resilient Kids Safe Schools package also included measures to reduce the use of punitive and exclusionary discipline measures, including changes to the discipline code and the NYPD DOE Memorandum of Understanding and the NYPD Patrol Guide. Among other things, these changes significantly limited interactions between schools and the police, including stricter guidelines around arrests in schools and limits on the length of suspension. We are already seeing the effect these initiatives are having in creating more supportive climates and schools. Last year, the first year under which these changes were in place, we saw a major drop in both the use and length of suspensions. Even before the transition to remote learning, suspensions were down 12.6% compared to the year prior. Including the period of remote learning, suspensions dropped 44.5%. We also saw a tremendous decrease in the length of suspensions, and this is really important. These were down 81% versus the previous year when comparing the portion of the year with in-person learning and 88% when taking into account the full year. Last, we saw the gap in racial disparities and length of suspensions close almost entirely. The average length of a superintendent suspension for white students was 11.1 days, for Asian students, 11.4 days, for Latino students, 11.5 days, and for Black students, 11.8 days. I want to thank the leaders of the Office of Safety and Youth Development, Mark Rampersant and Kenyatta Reed, for developing a thoughtful and measured approach to student discipline and behavior during remote learning, and for working with schools to assure its successful implementation. While we are encouraged by the results so far, we absolutely know there is much more to do. We will continue to build on this work as we begin the transition of our school safety agents and school safety division from NYPD to DOE. We know this is of great interest to the council and we will continue to solicit your input and keep you updated on our progress. Before closing, I must, I must ensure to acknowledge the important role that parents play in this work. We work closely with our partners in the Office of Family and Community Engagement to build connections with our parents, including providing professional learning for parent coordinators on mental health during COVID. We have also made available on the DOE website extensive resources that are shared directly with parent coordinators for dissemination to families. We take every opportunity to promote these resources, and I would be happy to work with any of you on enabling your communities to further benefit from them. Our goal prior to the pandemic was to effectively support the social and emotional well-being and restorative values of our students 
And that mission has become even more vital due to the trauma imposed by COVID-19. The systems and structures we put in place the last few years have been integral in allowing us to provide these services and support through both remote and blended learning. The council and this committee have always been supporters and advocates of our work. And I again want to thank you for the opportunity to provide to you with these details about what we are accomplishing together. I look forward to continuing to work with you and providing these necessary supports to our children. And I'm happy to answer any further questions you have. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Deputy Chancellor. I um, just wanna note that we've also been joined by Council Member Lander, uh, Council Member Rodriguez, and Council Member Drum. And before I go into questions, uh, I just wanna note for the record that I, I have always found Deputy Chancellor Robinson to be accessible, responsive, she gets it. Um, so a lot of my frustrations and anger and disappointments don't really lie with her, but with City Hall directly, uh, because she can only do with what resources she has and to implement. So I just wanna begin by saying that because it's important to note the, the, the really great work uh, uh, of, of folks in DOE who, who, who get this. And, uh, but you know, we, we still have a job to do to hold folks accountable. So I just wanted just to begin by sharing that. Um, Deputy Chancellor or, or any uh, folks on, on, the, uh, on the panel, can anyone tell us an updated number as of this morning, how many students are waking up today still without a device and reliable internet in our school system? Absolutely. Uh, we take seriously supporting all of our young people. And we know that um, all of our young people having devices, that is certainly essential. We still have approximately 60,000 young people in need of devices. And Lauren Cisliano from our COO team is here to um, talk more about our progress and ensuring that students receive the necessary support to be successful. Yes, thank you, Deputy Chancellor Robinson, and good morning, Chair Traeger. It's a pleasure to be with you all here this morning. Um, as the Deputy Chancellor said, we are absolutely committed to uh, ensuring that our students have what they need to support remote learning. Um, uh, as we've discussed, and as you know, um, we have ordered and delivered 350,000 uh, LTE-enabled iPads to students. Um, and based on the additional demand information that we've uh, received from schools, we ordered an additional 100,000 iPads that are starting to roll out to schools now and will be delivered uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, so that, um, and that 100,000 iPads is to meet, will allow us to meet any additional demand um, as well as ensure that we have um, uh, devices on hand for repairs and replacements. So we are actively working to get uh, those additional iPads out to students to, to get them to them as quickly as possible. And just, just so for the record, um, is it accurate to say that um, City Hall um, was made aware back in even in the spring that we would need more technology and I'll explain why we need more technology. First, um, when the DOE initially shared a remote device survey readiness survey the week before schools shipped it to full remote back in March. The questions were kind of fuzzy in the sense where they asked families, do you have a device at home? And so if mom or dad, or if the student said, yes, there's a computer at home, you know, that computer might be for mom or dad to work. Uh, and if there's two or three <clears throat> uh, children in the household, they're sharing one device. So we have a significant number of children sharing a device. Um, also, a number of schools could not wait two months. If you recall, the shipments came in months after March. Uh, schools gave out whatever technology they had. And if you were an eighth grader, before graduation, you had to return the laptop 
uh, and then you enter high school as a freshman and they didn't have a device for you. And I was hearing this and I was hearing this as a council member back in spring and, and in, into, you know, uh, into June. So I am certain that DOE was aware of this. I'm certain that City Hall was made aware of this. Um, were, were requests made to City Hall and to OMB back in spring and into summer to request more devices? Because I will note the mayor only announced that he's ordering 100,000 iPads recently when quite frankly, they should have been ordered months ago. Could anyone speak to making requests to City Hall and to OMB of more device, more devices back in spring? So um, I wanna highlight a couple of, of things that you said, Chair Traeger. Um, I think that um, as you know, the devices that our students are using are coming from a range of different sources. So there are obviously the central iPads that um, we have purchased and are distributing to students. Um, but as you pointed out, we uh, have encouraged and continue to encourage schools to distribute inventory that they have. Um, and schools, as you know, continue to purchase devices as well that are coming in and that they are distributing to students. So um, there are a few different sources that schools are using. Um, we know, of course, that um, there would be Schools who gave out their devices, we have heard similarly that not all of them were able to get those devices back. And so we've been working with schools to order new devices. We also distributed Smart Schools Bond Act funding for some of our neediest schools so they could use those dollars to purchase devices in order to backfill those gaps. Um, and to your earlier point, the and this is important, the device need is constantly changing. Um, you know, that which is why we're working with schools directly to confirm the needs. Um, schools are giving out their own inventory and students who maybe had a device yesterday may not have one today, may need a device. And so those numbers are constantly in flux and that's what we're monitoring. And how are you helping immigrant families receive a device who shared with us months ago that the, the, the request form you know, required personal information which they were uh, understandably fearful to return back to the government. And so that's why I had asked City Hall to change the, uh, the process to just let the principals decide how much they need for their schools and, and give it to their children, as opposed to this form that was in a way a barrier for many of our immigrant families to receive a device. Has DOE changed that process? Yes, so uh, in the spring, um, as you pointed out, because of the health conditions, we needed to ship devices directly to students and therefore get that address and personal information. What we have done though since the fall and are continuing to do uh, is to deliver devices to the school to distribute to the students um, for several reasons, including the concern that you mentioned. Um, we've also, uh, schools are also able to fill out the device request on behalf of their students, um, given some of the concerns that you raised as well. How many students are you aware of at this time that are in need of adaptive technology that is mandated by their IEP? So uh, here I have to apologize um, for the adaptive technology needs. I'm not sure if we have someone from our, our special ed team on here, but um, I'm happy to take that question back if not to get your response. Yes, because I, I want to note for the record that um, I've had families in my district and beyond re uh, reach out to me that uh, they're required to have technology to help them adapt to remote learning. And it is very expensive uh, to purchase this on their own, but they're actually required to have it. Um, but I've been hearing that some stuff is on back order. Um, if you can get back to me on that, I would appreciate it. Uh, are, has the DOE ordered Chromebooks and laptops? Uh, as a former high school teacher, I could tell you it is not easy for high school students or any student, middle school, anyone, elementary, to type essays on an iPad. Um, has the DOE ordered Chromebooks and laptops that are also internet enabled for our students? And if so, how many? Um, thank you for the question. So uh, I hear you on the concern about the, the keyboard and the difference between the Chromebooks and the iPads. Um, schools are able to purchase Chromebooks um, but uh, to your question about the LTE enabled devices, 
the reason why we purchased the iPads is because we were able to get a large supply um, and a large supply of the LTE enabled devices um, at a, um, a discounted price point. So um, for the Chromebooks that schools are ordering now, those devices are not LTE enabled, but what we have been able to do is order a substantial number of keyboards that go with the iPads, particularly for our older students. So the iPad that they get has a case that has a keyboard so that they can um, use it very similar to a Chromebook. And what is the plan, oh, by the way, I wanna note, a number of principals are aware that they could purchase Chromebooks, um, but many of them are on back order. And that's why you know, I've asked to see if we can contact the manufacturer directly um, to just order a large shipment on behalf of the school district. And I think, I think they would be interested in hearing from the DOE on that because many of our students are very interested in having Chromebooks and, and laptops to help them with functionality with remote learning. Um, so have you heard concerns from principals that stuff is on back order? We know that there are global supply chain issues. Um, there are the, the supply of devices is just globally not enough to meet the demand. We do work very closely with our contracted vendors to get them to prioritize supply for DOE. Um, but if there are schools uh, that are encountering particular back order issues, please don't ever hesitate to let us know and we'd be happy to help follow up with the vendor. Yeah, it, it, and there are many. So yeah, I just wanted to share that. Um, what is the plan for students who, even if they receive a device, do not have adequate internet or reliable internet? Uh, think about our students in shelter who they might have a device, but they cannot catch a Wi-Fi signal in their shelter. Where, where does the deal we stand on that? Sure, um, I'm happy to talk about that. So um, for students in shelter, any student that is having difficulty connecting, we are swapping out their current iPad, which is supported by T-Mobile for a Verizon iPad so that uh, they are better able to access the signal. We have a dedicated help desk for families where uh, families in shelter can call. We're also working very closely with our partners at DSS to, um, who are reaching out to each family to confirm that their iPad, um, that they're able to access the internet through their iPad. And we're doing those swaps in real time as those issues come in. Uh, as you know, the city is also working to install Wi-Fi in the shelters. Um, but in the immediate term, we are also doing those device swaps. But I just want to note for the record, was, was the government aware that many of these shelters had Wi-Fi issues prior to the pandemic? So I, I, I certainly can't speak to that. I will say generally though, that one of the reasons why we bought the LTE enabled iPads is that we know that there are students across the city who have difficulty connecting to the internet. And that's why it was so important to us to be able to get a device that didn't require, uh, ac didn't require Wi-Fi access in order to connect. Um, we have been working very closely with T-Mobile to boost signal in areas of the city and where that hasn't been possible, we're now swapping out for the Verizon iPads so that families can connect. Yeah, so I, I just wanna share this that, you know, I know that the mayor repeatedly said for months that every child who needed technology had technology and he kept repeating the talking point about ordering 350 or thousand or so iPads. I just wanna note for the record about 750,000 students in our school system qualify for free or reduced lunch, which means three quarters of a million of our kids live at or below the poverty line. So the need was always great. And I, I think, you know, I, I go back to my teacher days, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And it is unacceptable that uh, over 60,000 kids that we know of, I think the number is greater, still do not have a device and reliable internet. There is no excuse for this. And again, I am not, I am not faulting the DOE because I believe the DOE made these requests to the administration. I think these numbers were known, but unfortunately folks were in denial at the highest levels of our government and I hold them accountable. I wanna to get to, um, is, and just so we're clear, when will the 60,000 kids plus have a device in their hand? 
So the 100,000 devices that we've ordered, um, and we of course share your commitment to making sure that all of our students have what they need to support remote learning. Those 100,000 devices will be delivered over the next four to five weeks. Four to five weeks. Correct. And when did the school year, new school year begin? In September. When we are, you know, as you know, there have been global supply chain issues and um, we are trying to get these devices out as quickly as we can to our students. Uh, and our schools are also preparing um, hard copy packets for any student who doesn't have a device. Um, I know our Deputy Chancellor, LaShawn Robinson, wanted to add some more here. So um, LaShawn, if you wouldn't mind unmuting LaShawn uh, to add some more as well. Yes, I just wanted to add that this is absolutely a top priority for us, ensuring that young people have what they need. I was, I was um, going to add, Lauren, that our schools are aware, um, you know, who the students are that are you know, still waiting for their devices to come in and have organized um, to be able to provide support. The chancellor sent out additional guidance directly to principals to ensure that um, our students would have what they need to be successful academically during this time, not only packets, but textbooks and other resources um, that are necessary. And our first deputy chancellor and our superintendents have also been of great support um, and assistance to schools during this time to think through how to meet this challenge. And Lauren and her team, um, they've absolutely been working diligently. Um, we, you know, monitor this often, um, this issue often as a cabinet and really are working to ensure that every student has what they need to be successful because we understand that this is an added stressor um, for students and families. Um, and of course, we want our students to be able to engage academically and be successful. Thank, thank you, um, Deputy Chancellor. I just would like to remind the OE panelists to not mute themselves. To, it's okay to stay unmuted so you can answer questions. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, you know, this is, this is very painful to hear. And I'm speaking now as a teacher, not really, not just as a council member, because when I used to teach high school regents classes, if my students missed a couple of days of instruction, that was a lot. We're talking about kids with months of interrupted instruction. This is, this is devastating. This is, these are generational impacts. These are not temporary impacts. We're losing our kids and we have to do everything possible to help save them and, and to help meet their needs immediately. And um, that, is, that is why I am livid many times with the administration because they're, they're just in denial and they waste precious time. And again, I hold Mayor de Blasio directly accountable, directly accountable. Um, we have a mayoral control system. And um, for months he kept saying that every kid needed, had technology, that was not the case. That was counter to what I was hearing on the ground from many of, of my principals and many, many uh, families in my district and, and across. I want to remind the public that back in spring, when there were some communities having a debate about Zoom versus Google Meet, families in Coney Island were asking, where is my device? Where is, my, where is the internet? And so there's, there are two different tales of New York happening at the same time in our school system right now. Um, I want to uh, turn to um, wellness calls. Um, Deputy Chancellor, uh, do we know um, how many total wellness calls have happened um, since March to now? Do, do we have some, some numbers on that? Um, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, our goal is to ensure that um, every student is learning every single day. And, you know, that's why uh, our team um, and Lauren and her team, they've been focused on ensuring that um, young people receive the devices that they need. But in addition to that, that every young person is in contact with a caring adult. Um, that's been our goal um, before the pandemic, certainly during the pandemic back in the spring um, when everything um, just first hit us uh, so abruptly the way it did. And it will remain our goal after this pandemic to, to ensure that young people are connected to caring adults. Um, educators and school leaders, 
they have been um, on the front lines of this work, really working closely with our families and with our students and making that outreach at the school level um, and tracking carefully. Centrally, um, our team, the Division for School Climate and Wellness, uh, within the Office of Community Schools, where our support for some of our most vulnerable students, like our students in temporary housing and our students in shelter in particular, where those supports live, uh, we have carefully tracked our um, outreach through uh, wellness calls Back in the spring, um, we were, uh, I think the, the number was about 14,000 um, wellness calls. Of course, that, that body of work continues to grow. Um, and we're at about 32 or 34,000. I know Chris Caruso is on the line now. I like um, for him to join and kind of talk about the um, impact of those calls. Um, especially with our most vulnerable students, like our students in shelters, and some of what we're learning from those calls as well. You noted that um, you had an opportunity to speak with school leaders, to hear directly from them about what they're learning through um, their calls. And I thank you for sharing that information that helps us to be uh, reflective practitioners. Um, but I love Chris to join to talk about that process how we were able to codify the, the, the process and share these promising practices citywide, and then also talk about what we're hearing from our families and our students directly. Chris? Thank you, Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Uh, good morning, Chair Traeger. Good to see you again. Um, thank you for hosting this important hearing. Um, so as was alluded to in the last line of questions, um, we knew that supporting our most vulnerable and frankly, our most resilient children as Deputy Chancellor Robinson likes to remind us, our students um, who are experiencing homelessness was going to be a top priority for this administration when we transitioned to full remote learning. Um, and so last spring, we marshaled the support of our field-based staff who are dedicated to supporting uh, our students in temporary housing. Thanks in large part to your leadership, Chair Traeger, we have 100 Bridging the Gap social workers deployed uh, in schools that have um, the highest number of students living in shelters. We also have over 100 community coordinators. Uh, and in our shelters, it's not everyone always remembers this, we have uh, almost 120 DOE employees who are assigned to shelters uh, specifically to support um, our students in temporary housing uh, living in shelter. Um, the timing of this hearing um, coincides with our week of learning for that we call STH Achieve. Uh, you might have seen that Chair Traeger about all week we've been bringing together uh, our social workers, our community coordinators, and our family assistants to share best practices, to exchange ideas on how we are effectively meeting the needs of our students in temporary housing. And we're talking about the things that we've learned through direct outreach and direct calls to make sure that our staff know our children well. Um, Simone Pitts, one of our uh, Bridging the Gap social workers from the Bronx was talking about the connections that she's making to families to make sure that they know how to sign up for EBT, that they know how to access their cash benefits and their, um, um, their entitlements that, they're, that are due to them. Um, we had Jason Capellas, who's one of our uh, great community coordinators also in the Bronx, he was uh, telling everyone that sometimes he's called the backpack man, sometimes he's called the laptop man, sometimes he's called the clothes man. He's like, I don't care what I'm called as long as they know that I'm the man they can call, right? This is the spirit of the work. These are the people that are connecting directly with our families to make sure that they have what they need. And so last spring, when we uh, encouraged all of our staff to um, reach out and kind of assess the needs of the, the families, uh, we were hearing um, a number of things that we, um, compiled and kind of pulled together both school needs and family needs. And they're not gonna to come to any surprise to any of us, right? Families are worried about unemployment. Families are worried about putting food on their table. Families are worried about their children staying engaged in education. Um, and it was good to have this data so that our school leaders um, know which families need which supports. Um, and in closing, I'll just say, and I wanna follow up on Lauren's statements a moment ago, um, but I want to just revisit the staff that are in our shelters, and I want to give um, a, you know, a note of gratitude to Commissioner Banks and the team at the um, Department of Homeless Services, um, because our nonprofit providers of our family shelters and our DHS staff and our family assistants who are in shelters 
Um, they have been going door to door. They have been making sure that families know how to log on. I mean, I know I still have to call my kids sometimes when I get bounced off the Wi-Fi signal or my Bluetooth is connecting to somewhere else. And when you have multiple people in a single apartment, it's confusing and it can be complicated. And we're really trying to empower families um, to learn from one another with the staff that are in the shelters uh, to make those connections and support them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I would just add to that um, many schools have practices that they may not um, call wellness calls. Um, when I was a principal, there was an expectation for, um, I'm sorry, if you can put yourself on mute, maybe. Chris. Thank you. Um, many, uh, when I was a principal, we had practices in our schools where our staff members would um, contact families on a consistent basis. The expectation was a weekly call. And it was a call to, yes, check in on families um, and also to share good news. That was a great opportunity to share good news, to talk about you know, um, competencies or skills that we were focused on within our classrooms. Many schools have advisory programs. They have kids talk protocols. And then they have school-based support teams. And I talked earlier about the multi-tiered system of support. And um, what happens it, with the multi-tiered system, system of support, if everyone, um, if you think about it from the perspective of just visualize a triangle right now, and if you can, um, just join me for a minute in this journey. Um, if you visualize a triangle and you think through um, the foundation of that triangle or the base of that triangle, every school is working to provide foundational support for every young person. And the foundational support um, may look uh, in our schools like um, the ruler program, for example, where um, young people have mood meters and schools will build that in as a way for young people to share their feelings and share their experiences and what they're going through and really foster communication um, in a safe, supportive environment with a caring adults and their peers where teachers have a way to check in on the wellness of young people. It can happen through a restorative circle um, within um, a classroom where it's often a time, I, I remember um, a, a school that we visited um, in District 18. Um, and it was a time for young people to share their uh, successes, but also share their challenges as well. And the young people would come together and support each other during challenging times and then cel celebrate each other during successful times. We also see these kinds of practices through Stanford Harmony, where we have um, protocols such as meetups, um, where there's a classroom meeting or a buddy up, where there's one-on-one -on -one interaction and relationship building. Uh, we see it in classrooms as a uh, former teacher. You, many of our teachers, they have writing prompts for young people to be able to write um, things that they're experiencing or collaborative uh, work that young people may be engaged in in the classroom. So really building those skills um, across uh, a classroom or a school community, those foundational skills to ensure that young people can be successful. Um, and then we also know that, you know, based on those kinds of assessments, there may be more targeted support that young people need. And um, those would be tier two support, small group or classroom push-in. Or, or even um, top tier support, support that, that, that may be necessary, like one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling or clinical social work. So these protocols are really important um, to have and live in a school. Um, we describe them as wellness um, checks. And you know, like I said, we really thought through the, a protocol that we saw as a promising practice within the Office of Community Schools. Um, and their work with students and shelters in particular. We put the, this practice within our Bridge to School um, plan, resources that we provided um, in advance of school reopening this school year to talk more about what uh, a wellness um, call entails, questions to ask, considerations um, that the practitioner, the teacher, the social worker, the school leader um, should have as they really think about 
um, engaging with families in that way, because oftentimes families are sharing um, very personal information and we want to ensure that that's done um, in a way that's you know, caring with a great sense of empathy and understanding for what a family's experiencing. So I just wanted to share a little bit more so that you can see how um, these kinds of practices are embedded within school systems and structures like a school-based support team or an advisory group or a kid talk group and how schools will work together to collect data and make um, determinations about when more support is needed. And then as we find out information, like Chris shared um, centrally, it informs us as it relates to the resources that we should share with schools or the training that we should host for parent coordinators to make sure that you know, they're trained and then they have the skill set and expertise necessary to interact with our parents and our families. So Deputy Chancellor, and, and I appreciate very, very powerful stuff. And anecdotally, I wanna share with you in my conversation with school communities, there are some schools that are very innovative where every member of their staff becomes a caseworker where they're responsible for a group of kids and they call them once a week to check up on them, to see how they're doing. And during the course of those calls, they find out a lot of important and concerning information. Um, and they try to respond you know, within the school community. Um, but then I hear of some cases where there's not really connections being made. Uh, one parent reached out to me that their school just does robocalls. So just if, if we can just have a clear, um, you know, is there an expectation uh, or any type of requirement on a school by school basis uh, for proactive communication, not just during parent teacher conferences or you know, through Zoom, but communication with kids beyond a device, if they even have a device, to see how our children are, are, are doing. And I share this because we did get that data about spring attendance, which was deeply concerning, uh, where a number of our kids, predominantly children, our, our communities of color, were showing you know, low connections, low engagement rates, because many of them still did not have access to devices, reliable internet. And so what is the expectation now in our, of our school communities as far as wellness calls or outreach, whatever the terminology is? Yeah. There's absolutely an expectation um, for outreach to our families, um, especially when we're not, when students are not engaging. Um, there's an expectation that schools are making those connections. And we've seen significant gains over time um, this year as it relates to our attendance data. Um, and even in the spring, um, there was an, a certainly more, even more of an expectation for these, um, the wellness calls or the wellness checks. We also use the survey data. You mentioned that data earlier to kind of take a look at what we were learning from the survey data. Um, that information was shared with, you know, across um, the administration, but then also with superintendents to be able to have targeted outreach to schools based on the information that um, they were receiving in that data. Um, and then to provide support, support with strategies, support with resources. As I shared during testimony, um, we, you know, knew that we had to have a um, support to supporter kind of training. Um, because our adults were dealing with so much and had to really be thoughtful about self-care um, during this time. Um, Kenyatta's on, but he always uh, shares that we need um, our adults to put on their own oxygen mask, just like you would when you, when you take a flight and tell you, you know, if there's a crisis or something happening, to so put on your own oxygen mask first before you help others. We took that same approach through the support to supporter trainings um, and making sure that our adults had what they needed to be able to support our young people and our families. Um, but with that survey data that we administered back in the spring, we had over 100,000 young people who responded and was, we were able to build in systems for our superintendents to be able to push in to support schools when we were seeing um, troubling indicators and then celebrate schools when we were seeing really great work happening as well. Uh, we're gearing up for another survey so that we can continue to be reflective about our practices and make adjustments um, in real time based on what we're seeing in the field. 
um, and we continue to do that work. We're committed to it. So Deputy Chancellor, I want to share with you very quickly, because I want to be mindful of time, some of the things that I took notes on uh, feedback from wellness calls that educators have conducted in, in our city schools. Uh, one of the common concerns educators have heard um, is the issue of hot meals. Uh, a number of our students are sharing with our school staff that uh, the DOE and the learning bridges and learning labs uh, basically provide cold food. And in some cases, it's a partially frozen sandwich. In some cases in the learning lab programs, I've heard literally no exaggeration, a slice of bread because those issues with delivery. Um, and students have asked for hot food, hot meals. And some teachers have asked their principals, um, can the school use school money to order pizza to deliver to their students because they, they would like to have a hot meal. Principals were told they cannot use school money to purchase hot food for, for their students. So number one, is that accurate? A school cannot use school money to purchase hot food for their students. And number two, which is the broader, bigger question, um, is there a plan to provide hot meals for our students in, in school, whether it's grab and go, whether it's learning bridges, learning labs, is there a plan to provide our kids hot food? And I just wanna give context, the city of New York contracts with food, with food vendors to provide hot meals for seniors, Meals on Wheels programs. I've heard about some of the early childhood programs and I'm very mindful and I'm actually very grateful to our extraordinary school food workers who are heroes, essential workers every day um, that they have issues in terms of space and there's work safety issues within the, within the kitchens. I get that, but many of the programs for seniors are are, are made they're, they're prepared. These meals are prepared offsite and then delivered and shipped to to seniors. Is there a plan in place for hot meals for our kids? So we are absolutely working um, on developing the option for schools to be able to opt into hot meals for students learning in person. Um, I had an opportunity to see the menu next week um, and we will be offering uh, hot meals there. Um, and we also know, like you said, I, I appreciate um, you acknowledging the, the work of our school food uh, team. They've done an incredible job. They've served over 65 million meals since March, which is just um, unheard of. And our priority, of course, is making sure that students have healthy, nutritious meals. Um, but, you know, we have heard your feedback. I really appreciate you. I do. Um, you stay in touch with your school communities um, and you raise, you know, issues and concerns to our attention so that we can make adjustments in real time. And we continue um, to hear from our school communities and, and make adjustments in real time. So I know that there is, will be an option for schools to opt in to um, hot meals. That's something that we're working on right now. Um, in regards to using their student funding to purchase food. Um, Lauren is on and may be able to provide more insight there. I would have to defer to um, that team who may know a little bit more. Um, and if not, we will certainly get that information back to you. Thank you, I, I appreciate it. And uh, so there is a plan or something in the works to start having a hot meal access at some point in the near future, is that right? We're working on developing that option right now. I, I'd appreciate any information. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor, for that. Um, what about the issue of the Metro card, which I raised earlier, um, where there was a policy put in place that, in my, in my view, penalized students, high school students, um, from not getting a Metro card if they opted for, for full remote. And as I mentioned earlier, a number of high school students have taken on additional responsibilities working now helping their their parents families pay rent and they had no choice and then some kids in my district are using the metro card to go to a location to get internet service um are you aware of this issue and is there a plan to reverse it to give our kids access to metro cards um i was made aware as soon as you shared that information um i started looking into this um immediately and um we, I believe students are able to receive Metro cards um, when they have internships, they need to go somewhere, you know, to be able to study, to access Wi-Fi. 
or for um, different issues like that. But I can certainly um, get you the firm answer and make sure that our principals have the guidance that they need to make those important decisions. I'd appreciate that. And final question that I'll turn to my colleagues for questions. Um, do we have data, uh, Deputy Chancellor, on, uh, and I think you mentioned earlier about survey results. Can we get the results that you have as well over, over to us so, so we could see that? Absolutely. Yeah, because I'm very interested in that. Um, the, the number, do we have, do you have with you the number of students currently um, with a grade of course in progress? Um, and I asked that for a number of reasons. Um, this is a sort of a holding grade. Uh, there are many kids, no fault of their own, do not have a device, do not have instruction, do not have access. Um, and rather than assign a failing grade or grade incomplete, this is sort of a holding grade. A number of kids are still in that holding pattern going into summer, going into this new school year. I'm interested in knowing what is the total number of the students in the course in progress uh, universe and and of that number how many of them still don't have a device and don't have access to really meaningful instruction yes that is um uh, an important concern of this administration ensuring that we are providing all of the necessary support for our young people uh, we really ramped up in terms of wraparound support um social emotional um support for young people but then also ensuring that they're able to be successful academically and carefully tracking and monitoring the students who receive the mark of course in progress. Um, so that work is happening in terms of tracking and monitoring um, within our uh, teaching and learning um, office, uh, the chief academic officers team and within the Office of First Deputy Chancellor where superintendents are involved in reviewing the data and making sure that young people are completing those classes. Um, I know that information um, is available and will be shared with council, so we can certainly get that to you. And I also know, um, you know, I don't have that exact number, but when we track it, I've seen gains over time. Um, I'm aware that there's been gains over time in terms of students being able to actually complete those courses and earn um, the credit for that class. Yeah, I, I'm deeply concerned about this deputy transfer because um, a number of our students, as, as you know, have not had access to any meaningful instruction in quite some time. A number of our kids with IEPs cannot have all of their, I, have not had all their IEP requirements met. I mentioned before about adaptive technology. There are other challenges I've heard about the ICT classes during their, their remote days and so forth. There's still a severe teacher shortage even when schools were still open, um, particularly in high schools, middle schools. Um, We've, so uh, I, I would, and, and to my colleagues like, and to the public, these are the long-term impacts because these are the marks or the grades that stay on records and no fault of their own, our kids should not be penalized and punished for things that, that, are, that are not their fault beyond their control and quite frankly the responsibility of government to get right. Yeah. So I am very worried about this. Deputy Chancellor, I don't know if you want to, wanted to elaborate. I just wanted to share that, you know, the work that's gone into um, teaching and learning, um, really uh, providing support for teachers to be able to excel whether uh, during uh, full remote or um, in blended uh, format has been tremendous. I know Larry um, Pendergast is on today. Um, like I shared, that team has been really carefully monitoring um, you know, this process and ensuring that students receive what they need um, to be successful in those courses but also um, just be successful academically um, as they continue uh, work to learn uh, during this pandemic. So I would uh, really like to give Larry an opportunity uh, to share more about their outstanding work. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Yes, uh, to answer your question, Chair Traeger, the, it, it is a, a big concern for all of us. We do know the Office of the First Deputy Chancellor and the superintendents, the principals have made this one of their highest priorities. Uh, making sure that these students are identified, that there is consistent outreach going on, that they own completely the support for 
these students and making sure they have access to digital curriculum, access to uh, all the resources and teachers they're going to need in order to finish this work and complete their annexes going forward for the year ahead. Right, and isn't January a, a deadline for students to make up work to get that course in progress grade off of their off of their report card? Isn't, isn't January a key month? Yes, that is a key month. January 31st, uh, students are asked to finish the, the work that they have to do. The, the annex does not stay on their transcript. It does convert into a no credit grade. Uh, but what's important is that they successfully complete the course, right? And, and so there, there is a significant push on now to make sure that happens. So how are they supposed to, if a student still doesn't have a device or reliable internet and they have to wait four to five weeks, how are they supposed to complete a course by January 31st? Right, exactly. So, so there, there are a couple ways. One, if there is no device, they cannot be penalized for that. So we what we would have to revisit. We you know implement an arbitrary deadline if they physically do not have the option to complete the course. Uh, when it comes to support for students without devices, uh, schools have been creating a lot of resources in order to help them make sure they finish the courses. And centrally, we have recognizing that schools need additional resources. Our instructional teams centrally have created uh, from open educational resources, daily lessons uh, in get grades K through 12 uh, uh, to in, in the core content areas to that uh, can teachers can use, they can print out and they can make sure the students have the access they need for resources. They're made available to teachers a week in advance uh, in order to support them but we 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 also realize and one of the one of the lessons learned from the spring and you'll know this as a former teacher that the students need to be uh, supported by their teachers and so we're trying to resource the, the teachers and, at, and the schools to make sure that they uh, are able to see these students across the line they are as you said our most vulnerable students and and we're going to make sure we get we get it done right um I also want to just note that, and I think Deputy Transfer, I think we spoke about this also recently, that for those students who don't have a device, don't have internet, don't have access, that that they're not penalized, not just in terms of academics, but also in terms of calls to ACS and to their families. I know that DOE made, made a shift in their policy where uh, schools have to call um, the, 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 the families before anything that's triggered with ACS. but. My question is during you know, the course of that call, if families share that we don't have internet, we don't have you know, reliable internet, what is the plan to respond to concerns like that? And also part two of this, um, I am hearing from a lot of parents, particularly parents of young children, where remote learning is not working, uh, children are having difficulty, uh, and, and quite frankly, even adults have difficulty staying in front of a device all day I think many politicians have had issues adjusting to, to this to this life. Um, and what is the plan to support uh, our young children, our most vulnerable children, and also parents and families who are juggling work, other critical responsibilities, uh, while trying to help their children with remote learning? Could anyone speak to that? Yes, um, I can start uh, to address uh, the ACS. Um, issue and then Larry um, can weigh in on um, supports for our youngest learners um, with remote learning. We have, Chair Traeger, made it abundantly clear that uh, we understand that school staff have a responsibility as mandated reporters of abuse and neglect, and that's under um, New York Social Services law um, and the New York Family Courts Act. Any initial delay in reaching families or connecting with families for remote instruction alone is not a cause to report educational neglect. We shared this with schools in the spring, and we've done so more than once this school year because we do not want these calls to ACS to occur when uh, a school 
whole, there's a delay, an initial delay. There's no um, internet uh, service. You don't have a device. That is not a reason to report educational neglect. We have worked closely with our uh, partners in ACS, and we have absolutely provided this guidance um, to schools. Larry, um, you want to talk about support for our youngest learner? Uh, sure. Young and old, uh, they, we have uh, done a lot. Uh, we First of all, we came forward with, uh, over the summer, working closely with Deputy Chancellor Robinson's team uh, in making sure we're integrating uh, our academic instructional supports with the social emotional learning supports. Uh, the, it, we, it, our teams met all summer did four day trainings for principals in July, uh, also set up a, a nine day professional learning period in the fall. And, and the overwhelming message that we wanted to send to schools was that social emotional learning starts in the classroom and that we there is no academic success without social emotional health. And, and uh, I, it's a tribute to Deputy Chancellor Robinson and her team that she championed this cause early on, saw the importance of trauma-informed care, and we made sure we we integrated it into our pedagogical I think Larry professional there. learning and, and send the message that as as time in September, they would be putting social emotional learning first. When it comes to the remote learning side, we uh, the, the technical side, there have been hundreds, hundreds of trainings for teachers that have taken place uh, with tens of thousands of teachers trained. Um, and there have been uh, some collaboration in two ways uh, in approaching the work. We understand that um, parents are no longer partners in the learning part process in the sense of after school, students go home and then parents support what happens in school. They're now co-teaching uh, right alongside our children. And so we have, for example, with early childhood education, uh, the vision of the early childhood education created guidance for families very specific about what they can do, how much screen time is appropriate for each child, which is not a lot at such an early age, activities they can do with their students. And it included guidance for to de-stress as a parent because having one and two and three or four children uh, trying to do remote learning with the students is extremely stressful for the parent as, as well as the students. And, and they gave very specific guidance as far as self-regulation uh, and uh, emotional health for the parents as well. Uh, we did set up for our uh, for our teachers priority standards, uh, so they they were ensure an understanding. Some students had interrupted, many had interrupted education in the spring. That they would be focused on the priority standards from the following year and the priority standards at grade level as students came in. Uh, we also added. Uh, resources such as the blended learning considerations, which offered by content area, English, math, science, social studies, but also in the arts, in CTE, guidance for teachers about what practices they should use in an in-person setting versus in a remote setting, and included in, in the remote setting, we even said, hey, these certain strategies are going to be better suited for uh, synchronous instruction, and others, when, when you're not engaging directly with the student in, lot, in a live setting, we have uh, activities that are best suited for asynchronous instruction. So, uh, Warren, if I may, because I want to turn to my colleagues, but of the 300,000 students or so families that chose blended in person, some in-person services, of the 300,000, how many of them are were elementary school students? Do you have that with you? I don't have that data with me, but we can get you that data, sir. We definitely have that data and can provide yeah. Right, and of that, and also just to add to that data request, of the 300,000, how many of students have IEPs? How many children are, are live in temporary housing? Um, how many children are in foster care? 
because it is my understanding that a significant number of that were children in elementary school, our younger, our younger children. Um, anecdotally, I heard from the, some of the larger high school buildings that they've been largely empty because there's a severe teacher staff shortage and kids that were promised in-person instruction were getting virtual study hall because there's not enough teachers to teach. Um, but many of the kids who opted for in-person blended hybrid were our youngest children, our most vulnerable children, which is something that we have, I mean, it's certainly my office has tried to center the entire time to give them more options. Um, and I think that through these wellness calls or again, the, term, the school, the, the terms the school use, I think we're hearing a lot from, from folks, particularly from these families, that they need more services. They're having difficulties dealing with homelessness, with mental health crisis, with food insecurity, housing insecurity. And they rely on our school system to be a sense of stability, to be a safety net, to be a support network. And that's why I just, I, I think that we're just, we're failing to meet their needs. And I, and I know that many in the DOE understand that and um, we, we just have to do better. But I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleagues. Uh, we've also been joined, just wanna note, by uh, council members um, Salamanca, council member Brennan, council member Ulrich. And now I'll turn to uh, Kalima to call on members for, for questions. And, we, and members, we have uh, five minutes on the clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Traeger. I will now call on council members in the order. They have used the Zoom raise hand function. We will be limiting council member questions and answers to five minutes. The Surgeon at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. First, we have council member Borelli, followed by council member Barron, and then council member Levin. I will turn it to council member Borelli. Thank you and good morning. Um, your time on, again. Thank you. Um, the mayor just said on, on the Brian Lehrer show that there's been no uh, testing and tracing link uh, that they've found back to gyms and restaurants. So I'm just wondering since in-person learning has been going on for a few months now uh, and testing and tracing has been going on, whether the testing and tracing core has found links to school clusters and how many and what's the data you've received? Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, we absolutely work close with um, the test and trace team. Um, they have worked with collaboratively with the Department of Buildings to um, set up the Situation Room, which has been a tremendous resource. We have extremely strict protocols um, in our schools and a very high standard. Um, whenever there's a case in school, we move immediately to close that classroom and close contact. Um, we, if we have two cases outside of um, the same classroom, we move immediately to close the school. Test and trace is very much involved. And um, we have not seen um, many clusters in schools. I know that information um, is available is we work you know, to be transparent, it's posted on our website. Um, we immediately share communication across the entire school community and a school campus. Uh, so we have worked to, to be very transparent there. If there's information or targeted um, information, um, council member that we can provide, we would be more than happy to do so. Okay. So, so the testing and tracing core haven't really found any clusters that have been spread through schools, if that's, if that's kind of what you're indicating. Um, you know, the CDC came out yesterday, recommended schools don't shut. UNICEF has come out and say, uh, said schools shouldn't shut. Um, the World Health Organization just said schools probably shouldn't shut. The, uh, I mean, the last dozen or so peer-reviewed medical journal articles that have come out on this have concluded schools shouldn't shut uh, en masse. The uh, governments of foreign countries, the governments of neighboring states have indicated that schools shouldn't shut. So can you just tell us um, specifically, and by the way, there's an article in the Daily News saying that the city's health department also said that schools perhaps shouldn't shut. So can you just identify for us who within the DOE actually made the call to set the 3% limit and whether we stand by that? 
um, actually, um, our health and safety protocols um, were set by um, the Department of Health and the city doctors. These are some of the most, like I shared, um, rigorous protocols and very uh, cautious protocols. Um, as a deputy chancellor and also as a parent, um, my son, as many of you know, he is now a 12th grader in our school system. He has been attending um, some of his court classes. For right, but, but what I'm trying to get at though is, is I, I wanna find the person because there seems to be some consensus that schools are not super spreaders. Our own data from testing and tracing court indicates that they're not super spreaders. We're doing irreparable harm to children by not providing them with even the day or two of in-person education we were. So I, I would like to know who is the person who made the call to limit the, 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 limit the positivity rate at 3% to trigger the school closing so that, that, that the, the media, the press, other medical professionals can evaluate that person's medical qualifications and scientific qualifications and can make our own judgments. Um, we, the DOE, we're not, um, as I shared, the Department of Health, um, along with the city's doctors, that um, they're responsible for all of our protocols. We're not, as you know, um, medical professionals, but we do appreciate the partnership for the work. I appreciate them, as I was sharing previously, as um, both a parent um, and a DOE employee. Um, really having a very high standard. Once that standard was set, and it's been set for quite some time now. Um, yeah, but, but I mean, about that high standard. So, I mean, I'm reading the, the CDC's COVID guidelines, and the standard is so high that our transmission rate is actually in the green. Like, you know, they have the chart, like everything else, where it goes from green to red, and we are in the green level. But our standard is so high that despite being in the green level, which in the, the, the title of which is lower risk of transmission in schools, we've decided to close schools down. So again, I'm just trying to figure out if you're saying it's the health department, that's fine. That's not what they've been speaking sort of off the record to reporters on. But my concern is that we should identify who is making these calls and um, the time is expired. whether that is the best call, because I think that there is also clear consensus that we are doing irreparable harm to children by giving them essentially what's going to amount to almost a full year uh, of not wholly encompassing, uh, encompassing in-person education. And I'm afraid for my son, who's a kindergartner, his peers, um, you know, I, obviously you could see I'm angry, but a lot of parents are very angry about the same things. And I just wanted to be the one to just say this and confront you guys with it so that at least someone is vocalizing to you. And I'm sure many of you know this also, and I'm not, I'm not saying you're not aware, but you had to hear it, that many parents are really concerned about their children's development and education. And there should be more of an emphasis on reopening as robust of an in-person program as possible. Thank you. Council member, I, I, first of all, I appreciate your passion um, that you're presenting this morning. Um, no one wants schools to reopen more than this team. We have worked diligently from March when schools first closed to reopen schools. Um, we've been able to withstand um, significant opposition to reopening because we knew that it was in the best interest of our children and our school community. We have so many teachers and parents and school leaders who wanted schools to be reopened. And we are going to work swiftly However, in partnership with our health partners to continue to prioritize safety, but we will get our schools reopened as quickly as we possibly can while continuing to put health and safety first. So I thank you and I appreciate your passion. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, before we turn over to the next uh, council member, I just want to note, um, folks who know me, I am not shy to call out the mayor and hold them accountable. But I, I have to note for the record to, to certainly to my colleagues and to the public watching that there were, there were pre-existing conditions plaguing our school system prior to the pandemic that also inhibit our ability uh, to fully reopen the way folks would, would like to fully reopen. Um, it is hard to comply with social distancing measures when we still have schools that are very overcrowded. Uh, the fight to reduce class size is not new. The fight to build more schools is not new. The fight for more nurses is not new. The fight for more social workers is not new. 
Um, that is where New York State holds a lot of responsibility as well. And that's why I will call out those from the state that like to lecture the city about school decisions when they in fact have starved the school system, not in compliance with the CFE decision over a decade ago that disproportionately hurts our most vulnerable children. So all the state leaders who like to speak about the damage done to our most vulnerable children, they have a big part in this because they have starved and shortchanged our kids for, for many, many years. So I just want to note that the, there are pre-existing conditions plaguing our school system that also impact our, our ability. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Klima. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Now we're going to turn it to Council Member Behrman for some questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. And I'm thank you. can you hear me? Okay. And, and in full disclosure, I want to let everyone know that uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson and I have a common ancestor in the person of William Robinson, who was my grandfather and was her great grandfather. So I just want to put that on the record. Uh, we, I appreciate the work that's being done by the chancellor and his staff. They've got a yeoman's task before them and we've got to make sure that we get it done and we get it right. Um, we know that this pandemic has exposed the systemic racism that exists in all of the entities and institutions in our society. And it has exacerbated the disparity that we see between black and brown children and others in our educational system. So I have just a couple of questions. Um, we, we're talking about social, emotional health and wellness. And we know that certainly children in a social setting of a classroom are encouraged, they interact, they develop friendships, they learn how to uh, temper themselves in appropriate situations. And it's critical that that happen. Now during this pandemic, when there are children who are not in that setting, we've got to look at the, the setback that children are experiencing by getting a paper package of work and not having a connection via the internet because the Wi-Fi is not working, the spotty Wi-Fi, and, and the damage that's being done to the children who may be gaining academically, which I question, but who certainly are missing out on that socialization that occurs in a classroom, which is an important factor of learning that takes place in the classroom. We have got to get those 60,000 devices without delay. We've got to call the mayor to get the money, to get the devices and get them into the hands of children particularly those children who, who have other kinds of uh, hurdles that they have to pass, children with, with IEPs, children who are in temporary shelters where the Wi-Fi just doesn't work. We've got to do that. I can't emphasize that enough. It's not good enough to say it's coming. We've got to get it immediately, post haste, with all deliberate speed. We've got to have a date certain by which we will say Every child has a functioning device. Every child is getting the assistance that they need or their parents need to help them uh, use these devices. You know, I had to get on board with Zoom. You know, I, I, I missed the Skype generation and just jumped to the Zoom generation. We've got to get more of an opportunity, whether that be through mobile sites where parents can go and get assistance in learning how how fully to operate these devices. We've got to get 60,000 devices into the hands of all of our children, or we will be at a worse place when we finish this pandemic. It said the new norm will try to bring us closer together. No, it's going to keep us further apart in terms of black and brown children not having those devices. And, and as we talk about schools being closed and the disinfecting that has to take place either in a particular classroom or a school based on the uh, infection rate. Where do those funds come from? Is a, is a principal taking those funds out of their school budget or is the DOE providing the funds for that cleaning? 
Thank you so much. It's great to see you during the hearing. Um, I would just also like to share that um, for everyone that you don't take it easy on me, on us. We have very high standards for children, as you should. Um, and we hear you loud and clear. Um, I am pretty certain that the, um, one, let me just start by saying, I hear you loud and clear um, with ensuring that those 60,000 young people have the devices that they need to be successful. This entire team, we all hear you loud and clear. Um, that's been a key focus. We have talked about this, you know, um, throughout the course of the summer and reopening. Um, Lauren and her team, they've been following up and, and pushing um, the vendors to get us what we need. Um, we've been prioritized. We know that many of these devices have been on back order because of just ordering that's happening across the nation and, and around the globe, really. Um, but we agree with all deliberate speed. Time has we expired. Will, we will work to get those devices to our young people. Um, I could not agree more about this pandemic being um, a pandemic that has really surfaced what's been there. So Chair Traeger um, just shared that we've been dealing with um, these issues for some time, but we've also been dealing with systemic racism for quite some time as well um, within our school system, um, within our city. And um, the chancellor has not been shy about um, calling it out when um, it's been seen. Um, and we will continue to do that important work. Um, I will get back to you on the funds for, um, I don't know if Lauren is still on, if she can respond yes. quickly. Okay, good. thank you, Lauren. Yes, uh, just to echo what LaShawn said, absolutely, we share your urgency on getting those devices out and we are doing everything we can to distribute them as quickly as possible and have been and will continue to prioritize our most vulnerable students, um, including students in shelter and students with IEPs. Um, on the question you asked about the cleaning, so it was very important to us that all of those costs be covered centrally. So those costs do not come out of the school's budget. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Um, we've also been joined by Councilmember Robert Carnegie. Um, with that, we'll turn it to Councilmember Levin for some questions. Your time will begin. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I'm out with my one and a half year old right now, so we're out on a on a walk. Um, uh, so thank you, Deputy Chancellor, um, for for your testimony today. Um, I, I want to uh, drill down a little bit more on um, uh, on the 60,000 devices, especially as it relates to um, how we how we're tracking them, uh, how we're tracking the students um, that don't have them, uh, and particularly those students in temporary housing. Um, I spoke with Department of Homeless Services um, in recent days as the chair of the General Welfare Committee, and. Um, you know, we're looking at the end of the academic year, likely, uh, for when uh, there will be um, the Wi-Fi uh, 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 in every family shelter. Um, that's a that's a very large undertaking, and not the kind of thing that can really be done um, in in a matter of weeks. Um, so, uh, those children that don't have uh, working devices in shelter where there's no Wi-Fi, um, that's a that's a desperate situation. So, first question is how uh, how are we how exactly are we tracking um, who doesn't have a working device? Thank you so much for um, your question. Uh, Lauren is on, um, and I I know she has that information, and she's been working um, closely with CHS and our other partners um, in addressing this issue. Okay. We yes, uh, thank you for unmuting me. Um, thank you, Councilmember Levin, uh, for the question, and happy to share uh, the work that we are doing. Uh, um, to ensure that our students in, in shelter have access to uh, LTE-enabled devices. So um, uh, as I think you know, we've set up a dedicated help desk 
so that families who uh, have an iPad that isn't working or they're not able to connect, they can call our help desk and we are uh, replacing those devices uh, for hours um, for any uh, connectivity issue. So uh, we are continuing to do that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, DSS is and their providers, we're working closely with them to um, make sure that uh, they are reaching out to any families who have uh, students in our system so that if there are any iPad issues that they receive, they report those to us so we can address them. Um, broadly speaking, though, I just want to make sure it's clear that uh, one of the really important ways that we are tracking these devices, each device is assigned to an individual student, um, and every school has an interactive report from us with the latest information on the students on their roster, who has indicated that they need a device and how that need is being met, whether it's through a school's device or one that we are shipping centrally. Uh, so through that, we are able to have really clear information on uh, exactly assigned to which students, which then helps us troubleshoot when families call in with, with questions or need support. So right now there's 60,000 students that don't have a device, is that right? Correct. So what, what are we doing? right now for those students since we're all remote. What, 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 are, what education are they getting? Are they not getting an education right now? Yes, yeah, so oh, uh, I do. Ooh, go ahead. Sorry, Lauren. No, absolutely, please go. We've, we've coordinated um, and worked closely with our school communities. Um, the chancellor has sent out guidance. Superintendents are supporting schools. Principals are working with families to ensure that our young people are um, receiving the lessons and the activities along with resources um, ranging from uh, textbooks and other uh, supplies and materials that are necessary for our young people to be successful during this time. We are working diligently to get those devices in. Um, as Lauren um, has shared, our uh, deputy chief academic officer is also on, Larry Pendergast, he's spoken about um, resources that have been um, shared with schools and how we've been working collaboratively to make sure that every student can engage um, academically. We understand that we must have these devices in and we'll work diligently to get every single uh, scholar the device that they need to be successful academically. Okay, um, thank you, Deputy Chancellor. I just have one other question, which is about the uh, Learning Bridges uh, sites. Um, the mayor had announced when they first announced that this was going to be an option for families, um, uh, the capacity of 100,000 um, uh, for uh, learning bridges. What's the capacity now? And um, uh, obviously it's not going to be 100,000. And, and I want to know why um, we are not at 100,000. I've actually heard from particular landlords that they have offered space and have not been those those offers haven't been taken up so um how many how many how many uh spots in uh, learning bridges currently exist yes we, we continue um, has to ramp up. we continue to ramp up um with learning bridges and our early childhood centers that will continue to operate um chris peruso ha is our uh partner with that with the learning bridges team uh chris may have that information readily available chris If you can please unmute Chris Caruso. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Um, yes, Council Member Levin. So currently we have the capacity to serve 40,000 young people um, in our Learning Bridge programs. Um, uh, we've received applications from 46,000 families so far. So we're almost meeting the demand that we've received to date. We are actively working to expand that capacity. We have a number of sites in the pipeline right now, um, and we're working very closely. This is a true interagency effort, working closely with our colleagues at the Department of Youth and Community Development uh, and uh, our colleagues at City Hall to identify um, new spaces uh, so that we can get them ready uh, to onboard more capacity for students and families. So when do you expect to be at 100,000? Because I'm assuming that the demand will, will go up now that uh, schools have been closed. Yes, um, we too are anticipating um, increased demand. Um, we're bringing new sites on every week. 
um, uh, and we're continuing to grow our capacity. Okay, I would suggest looking at the Navy Yard. They, I heard from someone there that they offered a site and haven't heard anything back. So um, right. that's just one, that one indication. Okay. Thank you. We'll all follow right. up with that. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks uh, all. I'd also add, uh, Chris, and uh, every transfer, look at many of your high school buildings because many of them are largely empty. Um, many of them are reporting five to 6% in-person attendance. Uh, there are schools in Brooklyn with rosters of over, over 3,500 students, about 150 are showing up each day. So I think there was a proposal earlier this year that tried to use high school space uh, for younger and most vulnerable children. Uh, but you know, I'm gonna keep speaking about it because I, I believe in trying to center equity and safety at the same time. Um, I wanna uh, ask, uh, I don't know if Chris knows or Deputy Chancellor, um, the DOE has an Office of Adults Continuing Education. Um, has anyone taken stock of the technology needs for um, adults who, who are enrolled in the DOE's Adult Continuing Education? Yes, we absolutely do have an office, um, adult education. Um, Lauren may have that information available. I'm not sure. If the Sergeant at Arms, if you can unmute Lauren. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, so we have been working um, with uh, District 79 and our Office of Adult and Continuing Education, um, and I'd be happy to share more detail on that with you. Um, but we've been working with them to understand their device needs um, and uh, get some additional devices out uh, for, for their students. So Warren, how many students are enrolled in District 79 in total? Um, I unfortunately don't have the details with me, but we'd be happy to get you that information. And are you in receipt, are you aware of requests for technology by uh, adults in the adult education program? Yes, and we have been working closely with that program to distribute devices. So the number 60,000 that you cited before, that does not include adults, adults in the adult education program? Uh, correct. That uh, that has been that work has been happening separately. So the number is greater than sixty thousand. Is that correct? Uh, we purchased devices for them. I would need to check back with them on the outstanding need. I don't have that number right in front of me, but um, we've been working closely with them to meet their device needs. I take that as a yes, Lauren. The number is greater than sixty thousand. And I also just want to note for the record that um, there are many kids in our school system who are sharing a device because the initial survey that the DOE gave to families, in my opinion, was flawed. Um, they asked parents, and as I mentioned before, they asked families if you have something at home and if mom or dad or if, or older, if someone had a computer at home, it doesn't mean that everyone has access to it at the same time and, and equal access to it. So there are many kids sharing a device and there are also many immigrant families who still don't have a device because of the, the prior barriers there were set. So I think the number is far greater and then we're not really factoring in the kids who might have a device, but still don't have reliable internet. And I just, I said this at, a, at the previous hearing, it is, it is shameful to me that City Hall has a franchise agreement with AT&T to provide free Wi-Fi in Central Park. Let me repeat, City of New York has a franchise agreement with AT&T, a mega company, to provide free Wi-Fi for Central Park goers, but no such agreement for our children living in shelter. And I know that that is an agreement that was established by the Bloomberg administration, but it has been continued and perpetuated by the de Blasio administration. He is the mayor. He has the power to pick up a phone and call AT&T and say, you know what? Maybe Central Park, you know, folks can, can have, you know, internet service already on their own. Let's move infrastructure or get infrastructure in place for our most vulnerable children. He has that power, he has that bully pulpit. And I question whether or not he's even called AT&T or called any of the companies 
to provide free, reliable internet for all of our families. It's shameful and unacceptable. Kalima, I'm sorry, uh, who is the next member to ask a question? Thank you, Chair Treya. Um, I would like to say, I we said in the opening that we were not allowing for a second around the questioning. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to you, Council Member Traeger, and then um, circle back. In a so Deputy Chancellor, there was a report in a uh, publication about children in, in juvenile uh, centers that were uh, greatly also impacted by the decision to go fully remote, uh, where a number of them mentioned that the only way that they can communicate with their instructors is through uh, what's called a text chat, which I'm not even sure what exactly that means. Are you familiar with this situation where uh, students are in these juvenile centers where they don't have access to uh, their instructors and they're texting through some sort of chat? Um, I don't have that information available. Um, if anyone from the team has been supporting and you'd like to share, um, then that would be helpful. I, I would like to say I'm happy to partner. I, like I said, I don't have that information, um, but I understand that for all children, um, regardless as to the circumstance, um, I fundamentally believe, and along with my team, that schools must be places of healing, um, especially now. And um, prior uh, investments in cell and, and mental health have allowed us to create a foundation to confront this crisis and to be thoughtful and strategic about how we meet the needs of students wherever they are, what Ever the circumstances might be. I imagine this text chat is, I don't, I really don't know what it's about, but maybe there's some restrictions in place for some kind of reasons. I will absolutely um, look into this immediately following um, this hearing. But I know that we're not starting from scratch based, you know, due to your advocacy and your support. We have, you know, seen social emotional learning and trauma informed care grow across this administration. And I can think right now of some strategies that we would be able to utilize if we have to meet um, young people where they are in text chat um, format, but then also to advocate to push so that they can um, have more robust learning environments and to be able to um, engage um, at a different level. So I will absolutely look into that, but certainly invite um, my team if you've been partnering um, with Tim Lasanti, uh, Executive Superintendent Tim Lasanti and his team to address um, these issues. What I can say is, um, I'm sure Tim Lasanti is, Lasante is aware um, of uh, what you're sharing and he has a phenomenal team, um, a phenomenal support system. And I know that they would be on the front lines um, supporting this challenge and um, you know coming up with solutions. They've been doing work uh, social emotional learning, mental health and wellness, restorative practices um, long before uh, the division where we had an opportunity to grow these practices across um, the system. They, they have also been some of our first community schools also. Um, and, and now we ha we've had an opportunity to grow a, such an important program with demonstrated impact like community schools across our system. So we certainly learned a lot um, from that team, and I know that they would be addressing this issue. Yeah, and, and I want to just speak to that student population because a lot of folks enrolled in the adult education programs um, are folks that, that really rely on, on the social safety net. Many of them um, could not complete school due to societal economic pressures. Many of them had to help their families um, help pay rent and were forced to, to leave school early for, for a number of, of very painful reasons. Uh, a number of them were also single parents um, and it was very hard to go to school and manage childcare at the same time. And something that I fund in my district uh, with an organization called Opportunities for Better Tomorrow um, that, that I'm very proud of. And of course the pandemic has disrupted some of the services, but we fund in Coney Island a free adult education program with free dinner, free childcare, and wraparound services. 
and we saw retention rates incre uh, you know, uh, increase. Students are able to stay and complete the course because we, we knock down barriers to, to, many, to many of our students and um, who are a part of our fabric. They, they are our essential workers. They're keeping our city going. And, and so I, I wanna just speak to them and, and, and make sure that they're included in this population that needs access to device, internet and other critical, or critical support services. And uh, finally, Deputy Chancellor, we heard, I'm hearing reports that the mayor was on a radio program this morning. Um, talking about a, a school reopening plan that will be shared at some point next week. Can anyone speak to anything that you're aware of at this time about this? And I'm gonna, again, re-up something that I shared back in July, uh, prioritizing critical in-person services for our most vulnerable children, our youngest children, children with special needs, our homeless children, children in foster care, um, uh, our, our, our English language learners and beyond who are in, are in crisis right now. And um, can anyone speak to what the latest is? Because clearly the mayor has not been consulting with the city council. Um, such an important question. Uh, we are working to return to in-person learning as quickly as possible. Um, I know that the team has been uh, working on um, reevaluating um, some of the uh, thresholds that we have, but we will share the reopening um, plan in the coming days. I don't, I don't have the timeline. I, I apologize for that. Um, but we have made a commitment um, to um, getting our students back in school. Um, as quickly as we possibly can. And there will absolutely be more to share on this soon. Um, I would appreciate it. And again, I wanna just distinguish, I know that there are folks within DOE who have been working around the clock. And my criticism and my anger and frustration lie directly with the mayor of New York. Um, uh, and uh, I, it, this has been very painful to sit through this and. But, but my pain pales into comparison to what families are going through right now um, and seeing their children uh, losing months of instruction, which, which they're never gonna get back. Um, and the last thing I'll say, Deputy Chancellor, um, there's been a lot of talk about federal stimulus money and helping support the MTA, uh, which absolutely needs help. Uh, small businesses absolutely need help. They're in crisis as well. I really haven't heard about what the plan is as far as stimulus resources for our schools. Um, and I keep hearing about people asking questions about when can we return to a sense of normal back to March or February. We can't go back to February. There were pre-existing conditions that were plaguing our school system that inhibited our ability to fully meet the needs of our kids at this moment. When, when our kids need us the most, we have failed to meet their needs. We can't go back to what got us here in the first place. We need a vision forward and something that I know Deputy Chancellor, you and I share and I know Chris Caruso shares. And I know this is a big, bold thing to say, but every single school must be, should be a community school. Because in many cases, that school nurse and that school building, and again, many of our schools do not have a nurse, but that school nurse and that school building might be the only primary healthcare access point for that child and that child's family. In many cases, that school food pantry that's located in a community school might be the only critical social safety net service for children in that community. So every school must have full-time nurses, full-time social workers, full-time counselors, critical integrated services. Every school should be a community school and we should know what that cost is. And we should give the mayor, the governor and the incoming president the bill and our Congress members, our senators, the bill. This is what we need for New York, not just to, not to go back to February, but to move forward to 2021 and beyond to better meet the needs of our kids. This, this, this to me is an indictment that we have not been able to meet the needs of, of our kids at a time when our kids need us the most. And so, and, and I, I hold our government leaders, all of us accountable. Uh, but certainly, I think we need, we, need to, we need to present a plan and a bill to, uh, to, 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 to the incoming federal administration, to, to, the, to the new, new Congress, 
to our, to our, to our state leaders and including to the city administration. Um, and Deputy Chancellor, I, I would appreciate if your team, I know we've spoken about this, if we can get a cost estimate of what that would cost, what that would mean to make every single New York City uh, public school a community school. Um, thank you so much for saying that. You, you said this before, um, prior to the pandemic, um, as you know, we have celebrated the success of the community school um, program initiative before the pandemic. And I remember you saying it then that every school should be a community school. And um, that's so important because the community schools have been at the forefront um, of the work, especially now uh, during this pandemic. They're really designed. They're the schools that we need right now. And they're the schools that we will certainly need um, beyond this pandemic. Um, those school communities, uh, the work that's been done um, under this administration, um, under the leadership of Chris Caruso and his team, um, it's been evaluated externally. We have the evidence of impact here. And really, it's, it's really just been a national model where other school districts um, at this point and in other cities are coming to us to find out more about you know what we're doing so um you're dead on with that you've always said that and i appreciate you lifting that now i i really would like to give chris an opportunity to just talk about the work because the, the wraparound support for a lot of what we um discussed today um from mental health and wellness to health care support um to supporting a family who may be experiencing food insecurity or housing insecurity, or just dealing with other challenges, the community school model has been essential and an important part of our strategy to do this work well. Chris? Thank you, uh, LaShawn, and um, thanks to you, Chair Traeger, for your ongoing advocacy. The good news here is that it is not us alone that are thinking about this. In fact, just yesterday, the Brookings Institution um, in collaboration with our office, convened a national task force to help guide the Biden administration on a scaling strategy for community schools. We had former Secretary um, John King, we had California State Superintendent Tony Thurmond, uh, Linda Darling-Hammond, the national thought leaders around education um, have really been lifting up and saying that in this time, not only during the pandemic, but post-pandemic, community schools are the equity strategy for education. And New York City has led the way. As Deputy Chancellor Robinson said, cities are coming to us to look at the infrastructure that we've built. To have over 130,000 students enrolled in community schools across the city and to look at the trust that was established in those neighborhoods pre-pandemic so that those families feel a sense of support, connections and relationships when this crisis hit we were prepared for that. I, I just can't help but tell the story of, um, there's a community school in uh, Corona um, that uh, is in partnership with United Community Schools. Um, and their community school director uh, operated a food pantry out of the school every two weeks. And when the school shut down in the spring, it was remarkable to see there was an, obviously the need for food increased. And so they were getting hundreds of families every week and the need, you know, they, they, they had a, a great need. And so they had existing relationships with a local hair salon in the neighborhood that had to shut down. And they converted that space to become the community food hub right across the street from the school. It is that type of nimbleness. It is that type of responsiveness to community. And it is that type of empowerment of partnerships that will help us get through this crisis and hopefully come out stronger on the other end. So thank you for your advocacy that has been steadfast. And I can't thank the principals and community school directors across the city that come in each and every day to really put our children and family first um, to help drive this work home. And Chris, in closing, um, can you speak to the impact of the mayor advancing still a $3.16 million cut to community schools and what that means to the program right now? I think that in the time of this financial crisis, and I've been a budget director at city agencies in the past, I was a, um, you know, in the, administ the prior administration during the Great Recession. Um, we see that every program and every initiative 
uh, has to have uh, absorbed some of the reduction. Um, the fact that with your leadership and with the uh, administration and city hall and the strong advocates of our community-based partners um, to reduce that um, reduction um, to 3%, uh, $3 million, I'm sorry, uh, to allow 95% of the funds to continue flowing is something that we're working with our providers and our schools to absorb. I think the big question here, as you know, we have an RFP out in the street right now. We had overwhelming response to that. Over 550 proposals were submitted uh, by community-based organizations. The key here is going to be to make sure uh, that the RFP is able to fully fund these programs going forward. We can't in incur any additional cuts, um, and that's what we're really hopeful for. So, uh, Chris, I I'm going to just respectfully disagree um, that, you know, yeah, we are in a financial crisis, and we have to make tough choices, but... I will never understand why the mayor chose to prioritize a bailout of a private school bus company in the middle of a, of a crisis to the tune of millions and millions of dollars at the expense of programs that you yourself just acknowledge are vital to our kids, like community schools and like the program uh, LTW, Learning to Work, which are so vital for, for our older students. Um, I don't know where they found the money. To, to bail out a Reliant school bus company um, out of the blue, just made this announcement and it's gonna cost millions of dollars. And I know that the PEP recently postponed the hearing because there are still questions about this, about this contract, but I believe we need to prioritize every dollar for our kids and not for a bailout to a private company in the middle of a, of a financial crisis. So, in total, uh, I have $3.16 million cut that the mayor wants to advance for community schools. And what is the figure that, that folks have for, for LTW as, as, of, as of this time? I, we can certainly work with the COO team to get the information for LTW. I um, can speak firsthand as a former transfer school leader, uh, was a principal and an assistant principal in a transfer school about the importance of those supports for um, our young people, but we will absolutely get that information for you. Our chancellor has really worked with our team, our division um, to prioritize social emotional learning and to ensure that this work would be at the forefront and could thrive during this time. And that's what we've seen with the community schools in particular, we have seen that body of work as an incubator of innovation within our school system. And we work diligently to learn from those practices with a demonstrated impact and to be able to scale those practices across our school system. We've also been intentional and strategic. Um, after this division was formed, we looked at the body of work, uh, like our students in temporary housing and our students in shelter, supporting some of our most vulnerable or most resilient young people and we transitioned that body of work um, to live under the Office of Community Schools so that those wraparound supports would be present. So we've continued to uh, be a champion for this work. Um, both our chancellor and our mayor, I must say, believe deeply um, in a community schools program and work to scale that body of work. And I agree 100% with you about every school being a community school, as I shared, you said it before, and I appreciate that you continue to elevate um, this important work now. We absolutely appreciate you and, and your partnership. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. I, I believe that the Chancellor believes in this work. I am in disbelief that the mayor would choose to cut these programs when our kids need them the most. And just want to note for the record, and those who know me know I, I'm, very, uh, I'm a straight shooter about this. Um, this is a top priority for me uh, to restore immediately as soon as we have a chance for additional budget negotiations. This is a top priority. Community schools, LTW, um, our kids need these. I want the public to know in closing, learning to work program for the, our, adult, our transfer high schools. These are folks, these are counselors that have literally been lifelines. Not, this not, it's not a program, it's a lifeline for our kids. I know, I know they're young adults, but I still call them our kids. Lifelines. It is through these connections they learn about kids facing food insecurity, where they've gone out of their own pocket to get our children hot food, where they become caseworkers to solve housing issues. 
this, this is what's on the line right now. There's a number of crises embedded in this crisis. And, 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 and to choose to target these lifelines, it's, 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 it's unacceptable to me. And, and I am prioritizing them just like I did for fair student funding and single shepherd program, which are also critical to our school and to schools and kids and our children. And uh, th these are programs that must be restored. And again, we need a bigger vision. And that's why Deputy Chancellor, uh, you know, I, whenever you can get us that estimate, every school should be, must be a community school. We cannot go back. We only have to move forward. And again, I thank the panel for, for their testimony and their time here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair Traeger. We will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on after each pin who has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first panelist will be Assembly Member Charles Barron. Assembly Member Charles Barron, you may begin. Your time will begin now. Uh, thank you very much. First, I want to say to Chair Traeger, I couldn't agree with you more on the responsibility of the state. How dare they? How dare they? with a 170 plus billion dollar budget, only allocate 600 million toward a $4 billion debt for campaign for fiscal equity. And every state assembly member who voted for that is not voting for our children. And you're right. The mayor's talking about he loves our children. He respects our children. He prioritizes our children. Then put your money where your mouth is. You don't cut a measly $3 million from a program that's so important when you love our children, the Bible says where one's treasure is, so lies their heart. So the governor and the mayor are heartless. And I'd like to say also that the community school concept is a great one. We met with the chancellor around that. You're right on target there as well. And we were going forward before this pandemic hit. And finally, the chancellor's caught between a rock and three hard places, a bullying, incompetent, arrogant, governor who's fighting a mayor over some political things and the union head of the UFT. This is what this chancellor has to deal with. The worst thing that happened to our school system is giving it mayoral control. And that was something that the state did as well. If you comb the $170 billion plus budget in the state, and the 88 plus billion dollar budget in the city, don't tell me they don't have $3 million for our children. And don't tell me they don't have money to buy, to leave our children out with 60,000 children not having the equipment. And then as you mentioned about Central Park and they're getting their stuff. So this mayor, this governor has failed our children. I think we have a good chancellor trying to do the best he can caught between a rock and three, these three hard places. Good job, Chairman. Thank you, Assembly Member, and thank you for always, always speaking up for our children. That has been your consistent record, uh, and you don't mince words, and I truly appreciate that. You've always centered children throughout your career. I appreciate you very much, and your outstanding colleague and partner in life, Councilman Barron as well. Appreciate it. I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chair Traeger, and thank you, Assembly Member Charles Barron. I will now be calling on the next panel to testify. Merrill Mossum, Dana Ashley, Karen Alford. We will be starting with Merrill Mossum. Meryl, you may begin. Ready. Your time will begin now. My name is Meryl Moshum. I'm 16 years old, and I'm from the groups Team Take Charge and Dignity in Schools. 
In the beginning, I just want to make clear that the timing of this hearing during school hours is not conducive to hearing student voice. The big question of being in the time of the coronavirus is when we are going back to normal. But for young people whose, li whose, lively, whose childhoods make the basis of who they are as adults, there is no going back to normal. Our lives have been changed forever. We need schools to recognize that the person that we were eight months, eight months ago is not the person that we are now and will be for the rest of our lives. We have had our childhoods taken away from us. We realize that the federal and even mayoral government has not protected our health sufficiently. For me, I became an adult the moment that our schools went online in my junior year this March. I spent hours gla glazing into blank space, time passing me by as I submit assignments. I used to be the type of person who would always participate in every class, but now I get too scared to turn on my camera. And in some of my classes like gym, I'm being penalized for it. The only thing that I look forward to every week is my weekly therapy appointment to set up by my school. It's clear as day that we need to make sure that these services are expanded and let students that know that they have a therapist available. I should not have had to reach out for a therapist because many students don't even know that they are suffering. We need to make clear to our immigrant and low income families that these services are available and educate students about the mental importance of mental health from a young age in the school curriculum so that they understand what they are going through. Equity means that this funding for these services need to come from somewhere. And it's clear in the midst of the pandemic when we are all just fighting for us and our families for the basic right to live in this world without dying of a disease, we do not need to be criminalized. We do not need the suspensions and expulsions when education is our Time way- has expired. When education is our only way of making sure that we have the luxury of working from Zoom in the future, unlike our parents who are essential workers. But most of all, we need a world that recognizes that we, the ones who will carry the trauma of having our most formative years wrecked by this pandemic, need investment. And that is what I'm asking for today. I, I want to thank you uh, for your, your continued uh, powerful um, and spot on advocacy, not just for yourself, but for your classmates and your peers throughout our school system. And I certainly, I want to also apologize to you and to your students about the timings of, the, of these hearings uh, as well. I always want to try my best to center student voice. So uh, point taken. And uh, I just, I just, first of all, it takes a lot of courage to speak, speak up uh, and for students, at, 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 even in a class or let alone in a public hearing like this and truly appreciate you. And I, I'd love to continue working with you even beyond the hearing to address many of the serious concerns that you've raised, particularly around the issues of access to mental health counselors and helping students know that resources are available to them and that we need to fight for more resources. Thank you so much, I appreciate you. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Dana Ashley. Your time will begin now. I want to thank the Education Committee and Councilman Traeger for holding this very important hearing. The Positive Learning Collaborative is a joint initiative between the United Federation of Teachers and the New York City Department of Education. Uh, we work with schools as partners to end the over-reliance on suspensions and build safe and equitable positive environments for all children. Through intensive training in social emotional support strategies, coaching and courageous conversations, we aim to change the mindset of adults from punitive to restorative. We build relationships and we include everyone in a school building from principal to school aid, and now we include parents as well. We've been very successful. Pre-COVID, our schools saw a 54% drop in suspensions, a 44% drop in incidents, improvement in ELA and math scores, and our survey data consistently show that teachers felt more equipped to support students in a more positive way. Now, during the pandemic, We've turned all of our educator support groups and all of our in-person social emotional learning, crisis intervention and restorative practices workshops into virtual trainings and support. Our, coaches, our coaching focuses on what educators need most, self-care and strategies to better engage students virtually, build equitable communities and identify students affected most by the trauma of the pandemic. For PLC, the virtual platform and reduction of travel time has actually allowed us to expand our reach 
We've analyzed public data that's detailed the communities where the loss of life and the financial impact from COVID have been most severe. And we are expanding PLC beyond PLC schools to support uh, educators with our support groups and workshops across the communities that need it most. We are also making these vital supports available to thousands of parents and guardians across the city. They now have access to weekly support groups for grieving families, workshops such as ending the power struggle, how to stop getting and losing battles with your kids, along with access to our weekly live streams on self-care and stress reduction. Uh, PLC is making a critical difference. We are helping time school has expired. We're helping school communities cope during this very difficult time and we'll continue to help them heal when it's over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we will hear from Karen. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and our elected officials. Thank you for giving UFT and our United Community Schools an opportunity to share. Chair Traeger, thank you for your advocacy for community schools. They are uniquely suited to deal with the trauma and upheaval created by the pandemic. Our United Community Schools, which I'll refer to as UCS, have been bringing needed resources to our communities, ranging from mental health services to emergency food supplies to academic support for children learning remotely. We engage the parent, community, civic, and faith-based faith -based, based relationships that we have built over the years to deliver what our students and families need right now. UCS was uniquely situated to help students and families when the COVID-19 crisis struck. Our community school directors and social workers quickly converted our 32 physical schools into online communities and intensified the social emotional support our educators and staff already provided students and their families. From March indefinitely, September through November, our UCS social workers have provided group and individual counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, wellness checks, social emotional lessons, and classroom supports. What this might look like, peer mediation, play therapy, art therapy, anger management, coping skills, parent caregiver counseling, to name a few. Thank you to the council for your funding to UCS. We have more than doubled the number of mental health professionals in our schools under COVID. We have added online customized professional development trainings for our staff and educators on trauma, including one as recently as yesterday, as well as teaching strategies to assist our staff in the new digital reality. UCS's mission throughout the health crisis remains unchanged, eliminating obstacles to student success. We need your help to continue our work. And I wanna thank you for this time of letting us speak. I wanna just publicly thank uh, Vice President and the entire um, UFT. Um, it's important for me to, to share this uh, once more. Um, teachers have died in defense of their students. Teachers speak up and fight like hell for their kids. Um, when I was a teacher, I understood that before I could ask my students to open a notebook in class, I had to first establish a, uh, a safe, supportive learning environment and establish trust in the classroom. And if that cannot be established, it's very hard to advance academic work. And so uh, up to 80, could be more now, DOE employees passed away due to the pandemic. That was as of June. Many educators um, have experienced loss in their families and in their school families, personal families. Students have experienced loss. Teachers have always centered children. That is, that is in their bones. And so we are forever in debt, forever in debt to our extraordinary, powerful, resilient educators who quite frankly, still remain under-resourced and underappreciated and underpaid. And I just want to publicly note that because I know that sometimes folks get flack, but teachers have always centered kids and many teachers themselves are working parents. Some folks forgot that as well. And so this is personal for them. And I know that many teachers 
refer to their students as their children as well. I, I, I said, these are my kids too. And if I can't keep them safe in the classroom, I'm gonna speak up. And there are teachers that were, that were literally sitting this past week uh, in their coats, shivering cold, because the windows being opened was the only source of ventilation. Teachers have been speaking up on ventilation issues for years, not just now. They've been speaking up on the issue of reduced class size for years, not just now. The fight for more counselors, social workers, and supports. Th these are not new fights. And to the credit of the UFT, community schools is not a new, is not a new buzz. They have been on the, on the lead on community schools way before folks suddenly found this term. So I just want to publicly acknowledge that and give thanks to, to our extraordinary educators, the entire UFT and even CSA, DC 37, 32 BJ, the entire school family who, who have always been essential and just truly appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to those panelists. Um, this is a reminder to the council members that if you would like to ask questions of the panelists, please use Zoom, the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands, I'm going to call on our second panel, Dr. Sinai Bekus Kenton, Rocio Zumaya, Leanna Garcia, Rashida Harris. We'll be starting with Dr. Sinai Bekus Kenton. Good morning. Your time will begin. Good morning. My name is Dr. Sadia Beckles Canton, and I'm a member of the Community Education Council in District 5, the Education C Council Consortium, and the Healing Center Schools Working Group, as well as a preschool director for a pre K program here in Harlem. Across the city and nation, we have been exposed to the issues around COVID-19 in our homes, in our schools, and in our communities. And in spite of our best efforts, our education system continues to fail at supporting the most neediest students and the most neediest families during this pandemic. I ask that the city council will hold, continue to hold DOE accountable, but I must acknowledge the fact that Chancellor Carranza and his staff has worked very hard and diligently to fill the gaps and holes that for decades have been, that have been created by systematic racism, lack of resources, and lack of care for the most vulnerable children in the system. Being a part of this, the Healing Center School Working Group, they have worked diligently with the Department of Ed to create social emotional trainings and supports to help the staff support our children. Back in August of this year, they met with the Department of Education and they explained that there were certain trainings that were supposed to be mandated for teachers as we came back in the building. And my question today is that since that meeting in August, what tracking systems have DOE created to actually track to see if the trainings that they provided for social and emotional training to principals is actually being filtered down to teachers and students and families? Are there manipulatives and, and pamphlets or handouts for parents to be able to use or teachers to be able to use to effectively implement the training? And how many members of the DOE staff has actually been trained? Just this past Wednesday in my own district, I questioned my superintendent in regards to the training. And my question and ask was how many teachers have been trained? While she said that most have, there was still no clear understanding of which teachers have been trained, how is the training working and how are kids getting the services? So my question and ask is please make sure that we follow up with this expensive training that we paid for, how are people actually getting the services they need? And is it working for teachers? And lastly, while we understand that we're out of school, there are preschool children still in buildings and teachers are working in those buildings. I have a teacher who has a son who's deaf and has autism. And while she has to be in a building to teach three and four year olds, there is no place for her child to receive an education. So she's now forced to leave the child home with a babysitter because there is no enrichment center she can send her child to, no learning center that accommodates his special needs for being deaf and have an autism so that he can be educated too. How do we answer that dilemma? Thank you. 
just want to say you are spot on correct. And that is unacceptable what these educators are going through. Um, it, it, there are no words and we have to do better immediately. And uh, we heard earlier that the deputy chancellor mentioned that they're working on a, on another plan, um, but we need, to, we need to help our families immediately like yesterday. So I appreciate your very powerful and timely testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now be hearing from Rocio Zumaya. If I may, before I start, um, I'm going yeah, to time will be And then in English. Hola, mi nombre es Rocio Zumaya, soy para el líder en el Bronx y mamá de cuatro maravillosos estudiantes en el distrito escolar. Eh, um, En estos tiempos de pandemia he aprendido a utilizar mi tiempo al máximo. Mis responsabilidades como padre no solamente son cuidar a mis hijos, sino asegurarme que en estos días yo acuda de tres a seis reuniones por día eh, para escuchar sobre los estudios académicos de mis hijos, incluyendo los servicios relativos que reciben. Sin olvidar que buscar tiempo para cocinar y preparar comidas. Mientras escucho a todas estas reuniones, tengo que vigilar y asegurarme de que mis niños estén entrando a clases a tiempo que estén las terapias relacionadas actuales recibiéndose y que el internet esté funcionando. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué tengo que asegurarme de todo esto? Porque un maestro puede ver que un estudiante funciona y está emocionalmente captado para estar en clases. Un maestro para 25 estudiantes o 40 estudiantes no está bien. Los maestros no están capacitados para captar las emociones de cada estudiante. Actualmente las estructuras de clases remotas no favorecen el bienestar de los estudiantes durante pandemia. ¿Dónde está el entrenamiento? El Departamento de Educación nos dijo que todas las escuelas tendrían 12 horas por sección en gasto para planificar prácticas informativas sobre el trauma, incluyendo la personal. Pero no hemos recibido información sobre las escuelas que usaron ese entrenamiento. No hay ninguna responsabilidad. La meta sería discutir la capacidad de TREP, y planificar ayunamientos a nivel escolar para todas las horarios y de implementación adecuada que practica informativas en el trauma. ¿Quién garantiza la información sobre TREP? ¿Quién proporciona capacidad complementaria? Ahora, para el equipo de transformación, ¿cómo ayudamos a los padres, a los estudiantes y defensores en la administración escolar a involucrarnos más con el módulo de la escuela central en sanación? Todavía tenemos que recibir una respuesta del Departamento de Educación. ¿Dónde estará nuestra respuesta? Una vez más, ¿cómo llevamos el modo de, de escuela de centro de sanación a nuestra comunidad para que sea adecuada para nuestras familias? Demuéstranos que realmente les procura el bienestar de nuestros estudiantes con acciones. Gracias. Now I'm going to do it in English. Hello, good evening, um, good afternoon. My name is Rocio Sumaya. I'm a parent leader in the Bronx, parent of four children in the public school. Um, my responsibilities as a parent leader is to support families, parents, families who are in the most need during the pandemic, who have not received the proper help. Um, my responsibilities as a parent in times of pandemic has been beyond my limitations. Some of them have been to make sure that my students are in class on time that they are receiving the related services they are supposed to be um, receiving, that they're able to emotionally be on, in class, during remote classes. Why? Because can a teacher really pick up on emotions, social emotions of a student through our screen for 25 students, or, or in some cases, 40 students? That's not okay. Teachers are not trained to capture emotions for all students. Remote classes structures are currently not conducted for students' well-being during pandemic. We're all, where is the, all the training? The DOE told schools that 12 sections per, 12 per section hours in August will, um, to plan trauma-informed practices, including non-structural staff. But we have received no information about which schools use them. There is no responsibility. A goal to discuss the TREP training plan, schools-wide town halls for all time and the proper implementation of trauma-informed practices. Who guarantees that the TREP training? Who provides supplemental training? Now, for the transformation team, how do we support students, parents, advocates, and schools administrations to become involved with healing center schools model? We have yet to receive a response from the DOE. Where is our answer? Again, how do we bring Hill Center school models into our communities to make it suitable for our families? 
Show us that you really care about the well-being of our students with actions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Now we will be hearing from Leanna Garcia. Your time will begin. What's on mute, Leon? Oh, okay, sorry. I, this, I don't use Zoom a lot, all right. My name is Leanna Garcia. I'm 17 years old. I'm a student at Bronx Leadership Academy, two in the Bronx. I'm also the founder of a small youth-led organization in the Defiance whose mission is to fight for liberation and the bettering of our community. I join you all here today to address the lack of inclusivity of students and parents when it comes to decision-making by the Department of Education. We are tired of begging for schools to be centered around healing. And as a student, although I'm lucky enough to have some adults in my school who guide me, I'm tired of this not being the case for my peers. I want to ask why the DOE has been working at snail's pace for years when it comes to enforcing schools, especially in low-income communities, to be more healing-centered and trauma-informed. Why does the DOE continue to disregard the voices of students and parents? When, when students are in housing situations that do not allow them to engage the same way that they would in school, how would the DOE handle that? How is the DOE going to ensure that students are not facing even more trauma during remote learning if they continue to exclude students from the conversation? So many students don't have a home environment where they can, can, where they can adequately be able to learn and participate. And so many times are these students penalized for not being able to do things as much as they would in school. This causes more trauma. As a student, I want the Department of, the Department of Education and all of you officials here to know that we are putting you all on notice. I joined the Healing Centered Schools Working Group because they have re released a roadmap that shows how schools can make these fundamental changes and because they actually care to listen to the voices of students and parents, unlike the Department of Education, which has done barely anything to make these voices heard and to make actual structural change. Teachers and staff can only do so much at this point and parents and students alike. Specifically in low income communities, it's important for our voices to be heard and it is far long overdue. Our, our working group demands that the Department of Education includes students and parents in decision-making about schools make more healing centered because we know real structural change cannot be accomplished if they do not cooperate. I think it is by far accepting that the Department of Education refuses to listen to their students and their parents and make decisions that we aren't included in. It is disgusting that my, my peers do not have mental health resources in their school during this time. It is disgusting that our schools will face budget cuts. It is disgusting that we have to deal with these things during the middle of the pandemic. And we're putting you guys on notice and we want you to do better. I wanna thank Liana for a very powerful testimony. And again, uh, a high school student, as a former high school teacher, it takes courage to speak up in a classroom, let alone speaking in front of a large audience at a public hearing such as this on issues that she's absolutely spot on correct on. We are failing to meet the needs of our kids. So I wanna thank Liana publicly for, for her excellent and powerful testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Rashida Harris. Your time will begin. Rashida Harris. Oh. She needs to be unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Rashida Harris, and I'm a proud member of the Healing Center Schools Working Group. Our group is a coalition made up of students, parents, educators, mental health professionals, and advocates who are fighting for schools to become trauma-informed and healing-centered. We all know social-emotional learning and well-being are essential to our student success. Right, this is all we've talked about all morning on this call. We know that students cannot learn if they do not feel physically, psychologically, or emotionally safe. But even if our students have perfect social emotional skills, they cannot learn in an environment that is harmful. 
that is hyperpunitive or neglectful to their needs. We can no longer ignore that, unfortunately, schools are not safe spaces and are places of healing. They are not for our children. Even worse, schools are actually sites of trauma for our children. Yes, even in this virtual setting. And the impact of systemic trauma inflicted upon our children affect their abilities to learn, engage, thus causing further harm in our communities. Everything that has been said so far on this call, with all the work that has supposedly been being done, we recognize that our schools are still not able to provide support when students struggle emotionally. We need to go beyond social emotional curricula and create schools that are truly trauma informed. Healing center schools train their staff to understand the impact of trauma and engage whole school change to adopt healing centered practices inside and outside of the classroom. These practices help students learn and build social emotional skills. In June, our working group published a roadmap describing how the DOE can adopt this model. We met with Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson's office about our roadmap, and we were pleased when the DOE included our roadmap in their Bridge to School plan and rolled out a training, a trauma training that we recommended. But Training is just the first step. As Dr. Canton said, we need follow-up, we need accountability. And aside from the training everyone supposedly completed, we all still see little progress. We cannot sit by and watch another desperately another needed desperate. program. Thank you, let me finish. We cannot sit by and watch another desperately needed program fail because of poor implementation. Our students need schools that are prepared to support them with dealing with all the trauma of COVID-19, all the trauma of dealing with the systemic racism, racism that has plagued this country since inception, and the trauma that all of our school community endures to, um, from the institutional anti-Blackness in our school system. Chair Traeger, social emotional curricula won't, alone won't cut it. We need the DOE to plan ahead to help schools become healing-centered, period. We're asking the DOE to meet with us again to discuss implementation, and we're asking the city council to help us make this happen. The need for change is now. We all need healing. Thank you. I wanna thank you. And uh, I, after this hearing, uh, I will make the request to senior DOE officials that they meet with your organization as soon as possible, because I absolutely believe in your work and the importance of the Healing Center approach. Appreciate you, thank you. Thank you to this, this panel. Next, we'll be hearing from our next panel. Um, this includes Kavari Sengupta, Jehi Fisher, Rohini Ahmed, and Judy Ling. We will be starting with Kavari. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, my name is Kaveri Sangupta and I am the Education Policy Coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, or CACF, the nation's only Pan-Asian children and families or advocacy organization leading the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services. Thank you to Chair Traeger and members of the Committee on Education for giving us this opportunity to testify at this important hearing. Quote, go back to your country. We don't want you here. You created this virus are a few of the racist comments Nathaniel, a youth leader in our student program, lists as language he has heard during this pandemic. Another youth leader, Sophie, said, I'm, I'm actually pretty fearful, to be honest, about how I might be treated if I were to set foot out of my house. Students contending with such challenges to their mental health cannot be expected to learn as though these are normal times. Schools must provide language accessible and culturally responsive social and emotional supports for Asian Pacific American or APA students and their families, many of whom are members of marginalized immigrant populations. Centering input from community-based organizations, empowering those organizations to provide training to existing staff and investing in more community schools are essential to this work. Among other benefits, culturally responsive support will enable students to establish strong connections with staff, which is critical to social emotional well being, which in turn is pivotal to helping students learn. We must commit to fighting the model minority myth and ensuring that our students are heard, acknowledged, and served. Comprehensive support also places importance on reaching students who may not access mental health services due to stigma. This is more important than ever in a remote learning environment where students and particularly recent immigrants may feel even more isolated from their peers and educators and uncomfortable reaching out for help. We must prioritize accountability to the community through surveys or other measures after initiatives have been piloted or training has been administered. 
We have heard from community members that the system often considers the one-time implementation of culturally responsive education measures and other social emotional supports as synonymous with success. We cannot claim accomplishment if we do not circle back with the community. We also need data disaggregation to better understand the ethnic makeup of and languages spoken by our support staff, including school counselors and social workers. And of course, we need more of these staff members, particularly in overcrowded school districts in Queens serving large APA populations. For years, studies have shown that when students learn for teacher, from teachers who look like them, they perform better academically and feel more comfortable in the classroom. Students have shared with us that they feel similarly when their counselors look like them. However, although teacher demographics are collected and are publicly available, we remain unaware of counselor demographic data. DOE must report school counselor demographics to understand and access gaps and address Time gaps. Has uh, currently, we can only wield anecdotal and testimonial evidence of the lack of culturally competent counselors, rather than evidence from data from across the system. This does a disservice both to our students, who are likely not receiving adequate support, and to potential ed educators and staff who might be interested in becoming counselors, who may not see representation and conclude that counseling is the wrong career path for them. As we continue to watch existing disparities grow, we must be sure to center all of our decisions on our most marginalized students. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Jay Hay Fisher. Time starts now. I would like to thank the um, City Council and the Committee on Education for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jiha Fisher, and I am the Executive Director of the Korean American Family Service Center, KAFSC. KFSC provides, provides social services to the immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. All our programs and services, including our Hodori After School program, are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. KFSC's Hodori After School program serves Asian American students from kindergarten through eighth grade who are from families at or below the federal poverty level with immigrant parents and caregivers. Our Hodori After School program targets students who are under the care of single parents who consistently struggle financially and are challenged by cultural and language barriers. We also target children who are victims of domestic violence or sexual assault, as well as ch children who are indirectly affected from being exposed in their house, own households. Our program supplements and supports the myriad of challenges faced by our APA students, many who are immigrants themselves and are L students. The beginning of every school year, we conduct an assessment and find that close to 100% of them never finish their homework on time. They struggle to meet metrics and their report cards show difficult, dif difficulties in their classes. Challenges due to limited English proficiencies exacerbate already existing issues due to family violence at home, poverty, and cultural differences. Teachers and administrators at school often lack cultural competencies necess necessary to properly engage these APA students and often make assessments or decisions based on standards that do not take into account the cultural nuances that are extremely relevant in developing the correct academic plan for these children. The model minority myth is in direct contradiction to the fact that many APA students from immigrant families displayed serious emotional, social, and behavioral difficulties. Our APA children require additional support from school counselors to mitigate and work to reduce stressors in the school environment that hinder not only their academic, academic performance, but also their social emotional development increase their self-esteem and develop healthy communication skills. Our counselors and teachers at KFSC work with the families in our Hodori After School program to specifically address the gaps in the edu education system that overlook our APA immigrant student population and the families of school educators and administrators to fund and resource proper protocols for families to address their ch child's unique needs and challenges. I would like to thank again um, for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Roshni Ahmed. Time starts now.
Roshni Ahmed. Yeah, we have to unmute her. Give us one second, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Roshni Ahmed and I'm the Advocacy and Outreach Coordinator at Women for Afghan Women. Thank you, Chair Mark Traeger and members of the Committee on Education for taking the time to better understand our community's needs. Women for Afghan Women has been providing holistic and culturally specific services to Afghan, South Asian and Muslim low-income immigrants in New York City since 2003. Currently, our youth participants are facing high levels of stress due to increased workload and challenges with balancing schoolwork, familial responsibilities and an overall lack of social interaction. They lived in cramped apartments with multi-generational family members and their parents have lost their sources of income due to the pandemic. Increased support within the classroom and linguistically and culturally responsive resources within schools must be prioritized to ensure students' emotional and social well-being is not further being compromised by the additional stress factors created by the pandemic. Youth with limited English proficiency and in particular newly arrived immigrant youth have expressed further difficulties in accessing support and assistance in keeping up with and feeling empowered in the virtual classroom. Families have also expressed barriers in staying accurately informed and updated on policies in New York City schools throughout the pandemic. This has proved challenging for many parents to navigate making decisions around their children's safety, social, and emotional health. Schools must be equipped with the tools to ensure there is language access for every single community and person. Oftentimes, dialects or languages spoken by smaller communities are overlooked and ignored, both within the Asian Pacific American communities and beyond. We have seen instances during which community members could not readily access interpretation services or were connected to the wrong interpreter. Families and students should be aware of the resources available to them and with the support of trained school counselors, social workers, and other staff that are culturally responsive. It is important to hire school counselors, particularly in overcrowded schools who can respond to these needs. We look forward to working has expired. with the council to ensure the social and emotional well-being of our communities together. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Judy Ling. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving us the time to testify at this hearing. My name is Judy Ling, and I am a certified school counselor currently working at Immigrant Social Services, ISS. ISS is dedicated to improving the conditions and promoting the welfare of our community in the Chinatown and Lower East Side area of New York City. ISS has worked extensively with immigrant children and their families, many of whom are from low-income households with limited English proficiency. We partner with schools to provide enrichment, academic support, and prevention through OASIS, but that is not enough. There is so much more that needs to be done. The needs of Asian Pacific American community are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. We are constantly fighting the harmful impacts of stigma, systemic racism, the model minority myth, which prevents our needs from being recognized and understood. First, the DOE needs to lift the current hiring freezes. Schools were already understaffed, especially when it comes to people personnel services. COVID-19 is a traumatic experience, so now more than ever, students and families need social emotional support. I chose to be a school counselor so I could give back to my community but was appalled that I wasn't even given a chance to a job interview, not because I didn't have the skill set, but because I was born too late to be in this field. Just simply applying SEL in schools is not enough. You need the PPS to help address the crises. Teachers are not trained like we are, and they are already burnt out and overworked. Second, we demand that the city increase language access when providing information about COVID-19 and providing more resources to support Chinatown and Lower East Side area. Our Pan-Asian community is often overlooked when deciding who needs support. For example, on the Drive New York uh, NYC mental health support website, every resource is in English and less than half of it is in Chinese. I translated some resources because it wasn't done already, but realized that free internet doesn't apply to my families because the websites are all in English. 
So third, we demand that the city give more budget to hiring bilingual professionals. The little information our families receive in their native language are often hard to understand because it was a product of Google Translate, since the school do does not have bilingual staff due to budget cuts. Fourth, the city needs to give more funding for remote learning and technology needs. It has it has been eight months and many families still don't have iPads. I, hence, I had to lend an iPad to my nephew so he doesn't have to attend his Zoom classes on his mom's phone. The ones has who expired. Do, the ones who did, do have um, the ones who do have the iPads from the schools had to buy their own because the internet was lagging so much they would drop from their classes. Students often go to class with lots of background noises because their housing situation does not allow for a quiet learning environment. There should be more learning bridges locations without the restrictions open to the general, general public because there is a need for that. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Judy, I want to thank you for your service. Um, and I fully agree with you. We need a lot more counselors in our schools, bilingual, no question about it. And if, if you have any specific, I think you've raised some, some items already about some schools in Chinatown. Um, I'd be happy if you can, want to send me an email, mtrager at council at mc.gov about them. I'd be happy to follow. Thank you for your service again. I appreciate you. Thank you to this panel. We will now be hearing from the next panel, Dr. Dave Anderson, Alex, Alice Bufkin, Nicole Hamilton, and Laura Rebel Gross. First, we'll be starting with Dr. Dave Anderson. Time starts now. Thank you to Chair Traeger and the committee for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, my name is Dr. Dave Anderson, and I'm a clinical psychologist and vice president of school and community programs at the Child Mind Institute. We're incredibly grateful to the New York City Council, which has supported our work in New York City schools every year since 2012. Through your leadership and belief in our work, we provide treatment for students experiencing behavior problems, post-traumatic stress and depression, a social emotional skill building curriculum for students from elementary through high school, and workshops on a range of mental health topics for educators and parents. We also train teachers and counselors across the DOE on our social emotional curriculum and trauma treatment models so they can better sustain services year over year for their school communities. With your support, our work thus far has reached more than 45,000 students, parents, teachers, and school counselors across all five boroughs and every city council district. This year, all school communities are facing the new stressor of the coronavirus pandemic, and our social emotional supports, as we've heard so many times today, have never been more essential to creating an environment where students can succeed and thrive. To address this urgency, we've worked with the DOE as part of the Bridge to School and Healing Centered Schools Initiative to incorporate mental health supports into reopening plans. We're providing webinars and a helpline for educators across the DOE. We've also created a digital wellness toolkit, including videos and activities that allow educators to easily integrate social emotional skill building into their instruction, as well as take home worksheets to ensure that students of all grade levels can review and practice these skills at home and with their caregivers. These resources are available to the entire DOE and will remain so on our website, www.childmind.org slash NYC DOE for the entire school year. Our schools and teachers are facing unprecedented strain this year. And even with our best efforts, the mental health toll on students, teachers, and parents has been immense. Increasing the number of professionals available to provide support to students is only one part of the solution to this problem. The other facet of the solution is to provide the training and the resources to these providers to allow them to most effectively serve their communities. On this, we are working hard already. But there is still so much work to be done. We at the Child Mind Institute stand ready to work with you to scale the scope of this work further. The more we can do to support our schools, to make it easier for schools to engage and to integrate mental health services into the DOE's existing plans, the better for our students and their future. It has, been a privilege, it has been a privilege to work with you and with schools in your districts to ensure the well-being of students, educators, and families. And thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Alice Bufkin. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Bufkin, and I'm the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health at Citizens Committee for Children. Thank you, Chair Traeger and members of the committee for holding today's very important hearing. I am submitting written testimony with more detail, but in the next couple of minutes, I want to highlight some of the pri priorities CCC has identified. First, we must minimize and restore cuts to essential behavioral health supports and oppose cuts in the future, even in the face of dire financial limitations caused by the pandemic. 
New York will never recover from COVID-19. If the same families that have faced job loss, economic devastation, illness, and loss of loved ones are also harmed by reductions to their schools, healthcare systems, housing, and behavioral health services. As Chair Traeger and so many emphasized already, cuts to community schools, the Affinity Schools Network, and learning to work have already undermined the city's ability to meet the behavioral health needs of students. In fact, we believe that our city must meaningfully invest in the full continuum of behavioral health supports, from whole school trauma-informed approaches and training to clinical care in community and school-based settings. We believe the recent proposal to connect H&H &H to more schools will improve referral pathways to outpatient services. We would support expanding this initiative to CBOs. However, improving referral pathways is not a substitute for increasing capacity. Without additional funding commitments to the clinical care, H&H, &H, like other providers in our community, is at risk of seeing a dramatic increase in demand without an accompanying increase in staff necessary to meet the needs of students. Additionally, we urge DOE to reject punitive approaches that cause harm to students by pushing them into the school to prison pipeline. These harmful practices include contacting school safety agents, law enforcement, and EMS or ACS in response to instances of emotional distress that would, would be better handled by teachers and mental health professionals. We also believe the city should place a moratorium on suspensions, divest from policing in schools, and invest in healing-centered, culturally responsive, and trauma-informed services. Finally, we believe we, the city must develop a proactive cross-agency plan for reaching disconnected students, addressing their learning loss, and connecting them and their families to the health behavioral health and social services they may have lacked due to the digital divide. Improving social emotional learning is not just about new policies and initiatives going forward. It's about identifying those students and families who are left behind because of the digital divide or other complications of this pandemic and connecting them to the care and supports they lost as a result. Again, thank you for your time today and all your work for children and families in our city. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Nicole Hamilton. Time starts now. Hi, good good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for this time and for holding this space. Um, I'm Nicole Hamilton. I'm the Director of Community Partnerships for Girls for Gender Equity. And a lot of what I would have wanted to say has been said time and time again um, already on this Zoom. But I would like to just point out that um, Chair Traeger mentioned in the beginning of this call that everything is SEL. And I absolutely agree. Uh, but then we took a huge pivot and spent a lot of time talking about tactical, a tactical conversation about technology and tracking and devices, instead of talking about strategy and implementation for um, SEL. Because this is the really, really hard work that we have to do. And it's easier sometimes to divert to other things that feel more tangible. Um, we've been having this conversation ongoingly for a very long time. Back in March, I testified here uh, in the, at the Return to Remote Hearing um, testimony, uh, oversight hearing, uplifting something that Merrill just mentioned in their testimony, that young people were asking for therapy, and that was back in March. And here we are now in November, and we're still writing the same letters and, and, ha and sharing the same testimony, and it feels like we're on this, this wheel that's not stopping. Um, and at the end of this wheel are some really, really formidable models, the community school model and the healing centered uh, schools plan are models. And we may not be able to fix everything at one time or implement across the board everything that we wanna do to stop this thing from ravaging us in the way that it is. But if we can just drill down on the SEL supports that are outlined in these two specific things, the healing centered schools plan and community schools model, and start to create a holistic and comprehensive implementation plan, I think that schools will be able to actually achieve some of the things that we need them to achieve across the board, not just community schools and not just schools that have resources and not just schools where the teachers are not overwhelmed and saying, I didn't sign up for this and you can't just throw a bridge to school plan at me and expect me to implement it. But giving people actual step-by-step -step comprehensive guidance that meets them where they are. Every school is not in the same place. As the chair said, we're a divided city, a tale of two cities. So when you implement a plan that way, you have the likelihood of either having success or not and further disadvantaging some people and setting other people up and continuing to perpetuate a system of inequity. Um, we also ask that you expand the narrative of SEL to include the mental and further include the mental health and well-being of, of adult staff and teachers. Folks are at their wit's end and they're, and they're leaving their jobs. Um, and we need to resource this work. There are mental health professionals, there are youth service providers, there are folks who are doing this work regularly who are maybe burnt out, but are also very skilled and know how to implement these things. And we need to tap on that community and bring them in, in, in light of the community school model so that they can pick up some of this work that teachers may not be 
equipped or have the capacity to do at this time. And then we ask finally that we institute a, a moratorium on suspensions and commit to not further tra traumatizing young people and students through policing practices that isolate them from school because we know that a lot of folks are not logging on because they don't have access and some are not logging on because they are just disconnected. And what makes a disconnected student want to return back to a classroom and physical school if they have checked out? So we need to find a way to re-engage and to take care of the needs of our young people and our adults at the core and continue to build foundational and fundamental practices that can sustain this work. Thank you for this time. I, I want to publicly thank Nicole and I would love her as well. And um, I, I definitely want to share, I agree with you that there was quite a bit discussed about technology today. One of the, the reasons why I re-upped this was because during the course of, I, I conduct my own version of wellness calls with school principals in my district. And this topic keeps up, keeps coming up over and over again. And what I, what I was told by principals, which I, I don't know if it came up during the exchange with the administration, is that many of the sessions for therapeutic services are now virtual as well, um, but kids can get it if they don't have right. any access to internet device. So, you know, a lot of the central, even the uh, clinical social workers that we fought to save that are Thrive DOE, they are conducting virtual sessions now. They're not doing anything in person. So many, they can't connect with kids who don't have anything to connect to. And so mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct. We need to center social, emotional, therapeutic services. I just need to get the infrastructure in place for kids to get those connections. Um, and so, but I, I always just appreciate you and GGE always for always centering kids, their needs and their families. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we, next we will be hearing from Laura Rebel Gross. Thank, thank you so much. much. And thank you for getting my name right. <laughs> Um, thank you to the committee and to Chair Traeger. Um, and I want to echo what you just said about thanking Nicole as well, who is an incredible resource uh, herself for Student Leadership Network, where I work. I am the Senior Managing Director of Girls Education at Student Leadership Network. We operate two programs in New York City. One is College Bound Initiative, where we place uh, full-time directors of college counseling in New York City public schools. And the other are the Young Women's Leadership Schools. We have five of those schools in four boroughs. Um, around the city, two in Queens, one in Brooklyn, one in the Bronx, and our flagship school in East Harlem. Um, I want to echo what we've been hearing today about the great need for social emotional resources, particularly counseling in our schools. Um, like so many of the schools that have been discussed today, our students have been hit incredibly hard by the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and institutionalized racism. Um, they have experienced in their families job loss, more homelessness than we've ever seen before, a lack of resources, and because we are um, single gender schools with, with um, girls, they are also experiencing uh, the fact that they are caretakers in their own families um, more than ever before and having to balance that with being in either virtual or in-person school. Um, and so what we hear over and over again from our teachers and our school leaders is that they need counselors, that the parents need uh, family sessions and training on how to um, disrupt uh, some of the effects of the trauma that they're experiencing. Um, and that the one-on-one -on -one, um, working with the families uh, who are experiencing the trauma and the students that are experiencing the traumas is most valuable. I wanna take um, the remainder of my time to read a quote from one of our principals. Uh, our community has been hit extraordinarily hard by the COVID pandemic and systematic racism in our society. The zip code where we are located has one of the highest rates of COVID infections, death and unemployment. In addition, our, com our community is one of only black and brown children. With all of these factors combined, our students feel the injustice being done to them and the trauma this causes. We have an increased need for mental health support for both our students and their families. Thank you, and thank you to this to this panel. Next, we'll be hearing from our um, next panel. It consists of Eric Connor and Don Yester. Eric Connor, we'll be starting with you. Time starts now. Let's, uh, let's unmute Eric, thank you. Give, give us one moment, Eric, while we, while we were gonna. I think I'm good. 
All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Connor. I'm a program director at Good Shepherd Services, which partners with Franklin D. Roosevelt High School's Young Adult Borough Center, which falls under the Learning to Work contract that was mentioned several times during this meeting. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Traeger. It's a pleasure to see you again from the last time at our Brooklyn rally. And thank you to the council members of the Committee on Education for the opportunity to submit my testimony here today. Guided by social and racial justice, Good Shepherd Service partners and grows with communities so that all New York City children, youth and families succeed and thrive. Good Shepherd's work in schools began in the 1980s when we co-founded in partnership with the DOE, of course, the South Brooklyn Community High School, which is a transfer school, which is a small full-time high school designated to re-engage students who have dropped out or fallen behind in credits. Since then, Good Shepherd Service has been using both the trauma-informed and primary personal model to provide services. Our model focuses on individualized and group support that leverages educators, peers, and staff support. Today, Good Shepherd operates in 20 after-school programs, seven community schools, 10 young adult borough centers, and four partnership schools, with our 14 YABCs and partnership schools supported through, once again, the Learning to Work program contract. Annually, our educational programs serve over 10,000 students here in New York City. Social emotional learning is at the core of all that work. Uh, learning to work is much more than just a job or an internship experience, as I mentioned before in one of our rallies. It's a program that ultimately helps students learn how to live. And at FDR, Good Shepherd is exposing youth to opportunities and experience to help empower them with tools and skills to help them navigate decisions that result in successful educational experiences. With that said, the recent cuts to the community schools in the amount of $3.1 million and to the learning to work in the amount of 10 million continue to threaten Good Shepherd's ability to support students and, law, uh, and, and the communities they come, come from. Good Shepherd, the cuts amount to 103,000, which went across five community schools and specifically 2 million across 12 learning to work programs, one of them being my program. When participants and their families are faced with barriers, they turn to the staff at my program in FDRYBC. Uh, the 250 young people, 215 young people who we are contracted to support turn to two advocate counselors, one internship coordinator and one social worker. And this doesn't even include our shared instruction population as well. The staff is committed to identifying supports, resources, and making referrals. These connect the connections that the staff make, the relationships that they develop and create, and the bonds and the trust that come along with the young people. Uh, that's how we do our work. And seeing the growth and development of the young people we support comes with great pride. It's not only the English language learners who struggle with speaking English and they stay muted on the Zoom calls that the staff offer tutoring on. It's the young adult parents who are forced to choose between working a 12 hour shift or to provide for their family or to complete their online courses that the teachers are demanding they sign on to. It's the parents who want to ultimately be involved with their child who is in our program and need support to engage the young person. These are the situations that our staff are addressing daily to make it possible for youth to not only show up to school, but to be present and successful. With that said, we know that COVID-19 exacerbated the conditions for the youth and communities that we service. At FDR, the needs where students were, at FDR, these needs were compounded. The needs include need for equipment, continuing to work, and the challenge of accessing resources when in a mixed immigration status household, mental health, food injustice, racial injustice, and mourning for the loss of family members is always a constant struggle. We got to do whatever it takes to ensure the support of the schools that are fully funded to ensure that the safety and well-being of the young people we service can successfully complete high school. And I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to testify here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Now we'll be hearing from Dawn Yester. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Dawn Yester, and I am the director of Advocates for Children of New York School Justice Project. For nearly 50 years, Advocates for Children of New York has worked to ensure high quality education for New York students who face barriers to academic success, focusing on students from low income backgrounds. <laughs> During this time when families are facing unprecedented challenges, it is more urgent and critical than ever that students receive the social, emotional, and mental health support they need to succeed in school. We appreciate the city's and the DOE's provision of trauma training for school staff, release of the bridge to school curriculum, addition of two new mental health initiatives in schools and neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID-19, and commitment to expanding restorative practices to all middle and high schools and removing police from schools. At the same time, NYPD school safety agents outnumber school social workers 5,400 to 1,500. Black students and students with disabilities continue to be disproportionately harmed by exclusionary punitive discipline and policing, including the NYPD intervening in more than 2,250 incidents involving students in emotional crisis last year before schools closed, 
handcuffing some kids as young as five years old. 58% of those were black. We are hearing troubling stories from families. An untold number of students are not engaging in school at all due to unmet mental health and academic needs, including those who were struggling to engage in school before the pandemic. Students are going without the mental health services and behavioral supports they need to successfully participate in instruction, including a bright teenager and music lover with severe, severe depression struggling to engage in remote learning whose mother repeatedly requested evaluations and supports from her son's school and instead got threatened with calls to the Administration for Children's Services, ACS. Students are struggling with inattention and difficulty focusing, frustrated with technology, not answering the phone when counselors and service providers call to encourage them to participate in remote learning or therapy, not logging into remote classrooms or completed, completing classwork, and going without the support of their paraprofessionals. Time has expired. Are unofficially disciplined and um, removed from in-person remote learning. We have several recommendations. I'll give a few today, and I have a lot more uh, written testimony given the short time. Um, we, we're seeking that the city and the DOE honor the commitment to remove police from schools and create a, a school safety task force with public participation to, cr to craft a new vision of school safety that ensures all students are truly safe and supported. Number two, identify all students who are not engaged in remote learning. Provide targeted outreach to these families in a language they can understand through multiple means of communication without threatening to call ACS. Offer support using creative interventions, including mentoring. Address root causes of lack of engagement. Number three, clearly communicate to families how they can access direct mental health supports and services using multiple methods to communicate this information. Um, including on school website, home pages, the DOE website, sending letters to families, um, posting contact information of school social workers, counselors, psychologists, um, crisis response clinicians, mental health supports. Prohibit suspensions, number five, um, uh, uh, number four, suspensions for uh, students for all but the most serious behavior. A couple more things I just want to add. Um, create a system to track unofficial discipline and clearly communicate to school staff that removing students from in-person learning um, to remote learning for behavior or, or muting them or removing students from remote learning platforms constitute school discipline, including in juvenile detention and um, promote the use of positive alternatives that keep students learning instead. Um, we're, we also want to um, make sure that the new mental health um, teams of EMS health professionals and mental health crisis workers that will be dispatched through 911 and two high need communities that would, they must also um, respond to calls about students in emotional crisis from schools in those communities as well. Um, we're also looking to, um, we want engagement in interagency policy change to revise the NYPD patrol guide to prohibit the NYPD from handcuffing students in emotional crisis. We also want to ensure that students in juvenile detention receive better access to learning as well as mental health and, and academic supports. Um, they, right now, they're, they're, um, they're, they're not able to be seen by their teachers. They're not able to communicate except through chat messages. Um, and so we're, we're and, and they're also being disciplined by um, ACS um, and, and being taken off technology. And so we want coordination with DOE and ACS to ensure that that this doesn't continue to happen. Um, I wanna thank you for holding this hearing today. Um, and we, we so appreciate the ongoing work that you've been doing to draw attention to the social emotional needs of students and to secure critical resources for them. Um, we'll be looking to the city council to hold the city speak to the fire to fulfill its commitments, to foster interagency partnership and planning with public input to help get the data needed to better understand the extent of unofficial discipline and target solutions and to secure desperately needed resources to better meet the students' needs and get students back on track. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. I would be happy to answer any questions and thank you so much for letting me go over. I so appreciate it. I thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I have learned so much from your great organization and from many of the folks speaking up who have always centered children and their needs from day one. So I always, quite frankly, if folks listen to the recommendations, 
years ago, we maybe wouldn't have been in this deep, deep of a crisis that we're in right now. But um, I, I just a quick question, I don't know if Eric wants to chime in as well. Um, are there any types of cases that you have come across? I know, I know Eric, for example, I'm very familiar with FDR High School in Southern Brooklyn. Um, any type of cases you want to flag that kind of highlight the point of how deep our kids are in crisis? I mean, I have shared that through wellness calls and connections made with some students where they shared that they were facing food insecurity, where they're in a crowded dwelling and it's hard for them uh, to pay attention and to, and to hear even a remote class because other folks are, are, are in the home. You know, we, we, we take issues like this for granted, some folks, but this is the reality for many of our students. And some high school kids I'm aware are now working as essential workers to help their parents pay rent and have been marked absent because they're now working and they had to choose full remote. Um, are you hearing cases like this? Has, has, has that been flagged? And what has been the response from DOE when you brought this to their attention? So we, we have several cases right now just in my team alone. Um, and that's not even in the, the whole of Advocates for Children where we're losing these kids. I mean, I, it is unbelievable to me the number of students who, because of um, remote learning or blended learning, um, they, these are students who they all have mental health and emotional behavioral challenges in one form or another, whether it's autism, whether it's um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, ADHD, um, combinations of these things and, and what's happened, depression. And so they, they really need these wraparound services. They need mental health supports, both outside of school, inside of school. Um, to be able to, in addition to a lot of them needing academic support too, a more individualized support, one-on-one -on -one support. And, and, you know, I'm, and there definitely has been outreach by schools um, to some degree with teachers and counselors calling, um, but there, there has to be more in terms of, um, and, and one thing that, that I keep thinking of is we have to keep asking students um, what what makes what motivates them. What what do they want? And so, like we have one student who um, very severe mental health challenges that are not being addressed appropriately. And so, and frankly, it, it is so um, disheartening to me because um, their ACS is investigating this mother for some like. And I think it may be because the school has has called. Um, she was involved with ACS before because um, essentially, I mean, it's a long story, but because of the history of the, the, the father who's not in the household anymore, you know, have, there was domestic violence that, that he was um, abusive. So it was following the children. To, but what's happened is that ACS was with this family, supposedly doing prevention before we got involved. We, and then months, months passed. There are no wraparound services. There have been um, so this is this is what's so troubling to me is this this is this case is just to me the example of we know this family we have it the government knows ACS knows they have um, Children's Aid Society was involved and but but there's been call after call and visit after visit that this poor child um, has been sent to the psychiatric emergency room, not getting proper psychiatric evaluations um, and not getting proper diagnoses. And, um, you know, and then the school says he doesn't belong here. He has, he's too serious. You need to find another school. They're not finding another school for him. So there's like, this is where there's just layer on layer of like the very basic the, the, as the foundation is we need wraparound services for the family. And, you know, and, and, and of course the student, but supports mental health behavioral is really critical. And I see that in all of these cases. And it's troubling to me because it's not even that some of them aren't even involved. Like some of them have some kind of, they're touching the system, but they're not being supported in it. Some of them have like, like this student has a nurse practitioner instead of a psychiatrist. 
and when he clearly has like significant mental health issues it's it's just as a person myself i was diagnosed as a teenager with with severe um uh depression and i was on homebound instruction i i get it and and you need those connections you, you need the the supports and there's so much better treatment therapy medication um, support that can be gotten today. I know that there's a deficit out there, but between uh, like, I'm almost 52. When I, you know, decades ago, there was nothing. I mean, the medication, it was zilch. There were no therapies. There, there are so many acronyms of therapies now and different treatments that we, we have to figure out a way to, to connect our, our families and, and young people with appropriate care. And I know that's a huge thing to tackle, but we've got to figure it out because we are, we are, I can, I can tell you, we've got like half of our, like a good portion of our caseload, we're, we're losing these kids. And, and, you know, this is after, you know, like one of them, we got a great neuropsychological evaluation from Childline who, who was on there, you know, they do amazing work and they do it often at a very discounted price for, you know, for us. So, um, I'll just stop there, but, but thank you so much for paying so much attention, caring so much, um, Chair Traeger. You, you're, you're really, what can I say? I, I, you, pay, you pay the attention to this issue that, that it really needs, and I, I'm really hoping that we can pull together. We have great minds in the city. We have, we have incredible, um, you know, so many people who care and want to do well. And I think we, we, we have to just figure out how to, how to tackle these issues. And, and I'm hoping that um, the council and also um, the Department of Education and City Hall will pay attention to the recommendations that I'm making and, and my colleagues, you know, other colleagues here. And again, there are other recommendations that I didn't quite get to because of time. Appreciate it, Dawn. I, I'm certainly paying attention, and I know many folks in the council uh, take this serious. And I, I don't want to speak for I know Deputy Chancellor Robinson is still with us, but I'm sure that she, these words impact her, you know, as what she hears you as well. Um, Eric, did you want to add anything about some cases at FDR that you might want to share? Yeah, real briefly, I think it comes down to something that I believe uh, Deputy Chancellor uh, Robinson mentioned about found foundational support. I think that's what it comes down to for a lot of the things that are being mentioned, uh, the tech issues, the training issues, SEL being implemented. I think we have to really get back to the root of things and making sure not only the students, but the staff, their families, everybody involved, all the stakeholders within the services that we provide are getting trained and acclimated to the new way of things, which is being conscious of all the moving pieces, the different variables that are taking place right now with the city and everything going on and supporting the students in their path towards success. So in short, it's really getting back to the foundation and kind of restructuring and reinventing the wheel that we've been stuck on as somebody else mentioned. Uh, we gotta get out of that and start moving forward and planning ahead because these things are not changing as we've seen in the past months. And I, I'm gonna put a plug in for Deputy Chancellor Robinson on another issue. We didn't hear this today uh, but I know that this means a lot to her and I'm going to connect it to what's happening to today. Um, I have heard, because I am a former high school teacher, so I'm in touch with a lot of my high school colleagues and high school communities. Um, the number of uh, coaches, folks who are part of the athletic programs, who have always taken on the roles of mentors and sort of caseworkers for their, for their kids those schools that have access and resources in terms of the PSAL and athletic programs, a lot of that staff checks on their kids like every single day and also deliver food and make sure that there's kids. So we were, what's painful is that right before this pandemic, we had met with Deputy Chancellor Robinson to discuss how do we expand that opportunity to all of our kids, all of our programs. But I wanna just give an acknowledgement and a public shout out to our, to our PSAL folks who, have also become caseworkers, um, helping our kids, be, being their social safe net. As it is, many of the kids were going through a very hard time in life, and now they're relying on them even more. So I just want to just acknowledge that for the record and say that that's a part of our fight for equity for, for all of our kids. Absolutely. Um, and Chair Traeger, you were, you know, and still are committed to that body of work. 
um, and making sure that we do right by our young people there. I'm a full partner. We can't wait to get our sports programming back up and running. Um, and I'd love to meet with you um, in the coming weeks to talk about the model that we're proposing to get us through the rest of the school year. Um, and thank you, Don and Eric um, and, and everyone else for your testimony. I'm here, I'm listening, I'm taking notes. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me at any time. You know, Don, you know how to reach me. Um, we're partners in this together and I am absolutely committed um, and looking forward to continued growth um, in this area for the DOE. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Earlier we had testimony, I'm not sure if you were, uh, if you heard uh, from I think Dr. Rashida Harris about the Healing Center asking for a meeting. If, if, if we could help make that connection, I, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Okay, uh, thank you, Klima. We, we can move on to the next one. Thanks, thanks to the panel for your great work. Truly appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel as well. Um, next, we'll be hearing from our final panel, um, Jana Rudna, Travis Atkins, Aisha Taylor, and Nija Howard. We'll be starting with Jenna Brunner. Time thank starts you. now. Thank you so much, Klima. And thank you to Councilman, Council Member Traeger and the Education Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today, um, as well as all the support you've provided to counseling in schools um, throughout the years. Again, my name is Jenna Brunner. I'm one of the Chief Program Officers at Counseling in Schools. And I'd like to focus on something that um, I don't believe I heard about yet today, which is the Extended School Day Violence Prevention Program grant. Um, since July, we've re we basically have received no information from the city or the state about when these funds might be reinstated. Um, the state is already withholding 20% of last year's ESD SVP funding for services that were already completed um, and seems to be appearing to withdraw from their fifth year contractual commitment to this program for the 2021 school year. Um, the SVP programs are specifically focused on violence prevention for young people. And obviously that's needed more now than ever before. Um, you know, every day in the news, average New Yorkers keep hearing about the increase in violent crimes throughout the city, yet our most vulnerable children and families are living it. Um, as we know, violence leaves a lasting wound on the entire community from the perpetrator to the victim, along with everybody in between. Um, and it's a mark that really is etched into the psyche of our young people. So as a CBO that has pre previously received these SBP funds to provide mental health counseling, we're very concerned um, that organizations such as ours that have both the capacity and commitment to heal these emotional wounds of violence and provide hopeful options to young people have been on, put on hold indefinitely. Um, you know, without the source, the access to mental health counselors for children is severely limited. So my request, um, in this testimony is basically to ask for your support in focusing efforts and advocacy to get these and other funding streams reinstated immediately so that we can help our communities heal and offer a more hopeful future for our children. And I thank you for your time. I just want to say I took note of that and uh, I will try to get more information and circle back with you. And I'm going to give a, a, a big plug for counseling in schools. They're doing God's work in schools in Coney Island. I am so grateful that we had this partnership and uh, through art therapy, it is making a tremendous, tremendous positive difference. I mean, the kids, before the pandemic, I visited um, a, a, the, the, the classroom and they were gravitating uh, to, to, to the art therapist. And I just wanna thank you. And uh, I, we're gonna fight for more resources because every school should, should have these types of resources and opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Travis Atkins. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Travis. I'm a, a, a parent of a student at PS 130 in Brooklyn. And um, let me first just say that um, hearing the sort of unvarnished truth of what the council um, is up against um, on so many fronts has really given me a new appreciation for the work you do. And I really wanna applaud you for all the work you do in so many ways, um, not just now during the pandemic, but you know, you know, all year long, every year. Um, but that said, you know, I would love to see if uh, some of this great effort you pour forth into things, more of it could be poured forth into 
the single most pressing uh, problem facing New York City right now, which is the fact that public schools should not be closed. They should be reopened. Um, I've heard exactly one council member, that was council member Borelli, um, say that in, in as, in as uh, straightforward a way as it needs to be said. There, the, the overwhelming global uh, scientific and political consensus is that schools should be open. And, and, I, and I wanna say it, open fully, not partially, fully and immediately. Um, you know, Council Member Traeger, you know, um, you, one thing you brought up, I just want to address is you, you said that, you know, one reason we can't do that is because of the overcrowding issue. Well, a you know, partial list of companies, countries that do not follow the six foot um, distancing rule that seems to be stuck in everybody's head here, are just a partial list, England, Italy, France, Switzerland, Portugal, um, the WHO, the World Health Organization has said that the, that the six feet uh, man, uh, rule is not necessary. So by sticking to these, and the mayor's arbitrary and unscientific 3% metric, um, you know, the, the council should publicly state that they do not support that policy. And you should use whatever means are at your disposal to take decision-making power away from the mayor. I don't know what you can do uh, to stop this runaway train of a, of a mayoral administration, but, um, you know, they, they, at this point, we should be going forward. And instead, we're going backwards. And I do not understand why in this, this four hours that I've been on this call, Exactly one council member has said, fully straightforward, schools should be reopened. Why can't we just say that? Why can't we just say that and do that? Thank you. So Travis, I, I appreciate your testimony and, um, and maybe I, I wasn't uh, more clear. Uh, I shared a different vision than the mayor back in July uh, and I still stand by it. And I believe in a phased in approach beginning with uh, our youngest children, most vulnerable children, all kids with IEPs, multilingual learners, children in temporary housing, children in foster care, children in unsafe housing situations. Um, they are in absolute vital need of some in-person services. The challenge for the entire system to go, uh, to go back is it's numerous. Uh, first of all, the, the administration still has not shared with us how many teachers are they short by for full in-person instruction. You can't have in-person instruction without a teacher. Um, that problem particularly hurts, uh, impacts high schools and middle schools because you need specific licensed educators to teach specific subjects. So if a high school has two or three science and chemistry teachers and they're both out, you can't put a history teacher to teach a chemistry class. You need a licensed chemistry teacher to teach that class. Many of our high schools are facing this exact problem. So what, what ends up happening is students come into school expecting in-person instruction. Instead, they have an adult watching them as they're Zooming with their teacher working from home. And many kids say, hey, I didn't sign up for this. This is not in-person instruction. In some cases in a school, all of their counselors have been granted, have applied for medical accommodations working from home. So we, we have a severe staff shortage, fiscal crisis pandemic. It, it is still CDC guidance and other guidance with regards to social distancing. Um, and that presents a challenge for some school communities. So what I'm saying is um, prioritize a reopening proposal for our most vulnerable children, take stock of that, and then you build from there. Uh, it does not, and also for high school kids who absolutely need some form of social interaction, where you know, let's partner with our libraries, our local community centers, uh, YMCA's and others to create in-person enrichment opportunities as well for them. Um, there, there, are, there are college campuses that are literally closed right now, sitting dormant because many of their students are remote. We could be utilizing that space as well. So we need to get creative and innovative but I think what happened, Travis, which the mayor has basically acknowledged, he really did not have a plan. And he's kind of, you know, and, and now he's promising a new plan moving forward. Uh, but, and I wanna be very clear, um, as you mentioned correctly, we're under a mayoral control system. The mayor has been really calling the shots. And that's why, and I wanna just acknowledge that many folks at DOE have been working very hard to try to operationalize everything and also want to give a shout out to principals and their school leadership. Every single thing that City Hall tweets about, guess who has to operationalize everything? Those are your principals, your assistant principals, your, your school teams. They are the ones 
that absolutely have to operationalize everything. So I just want to acknowledge their work as well. So uh, with that, I thank you, Travis, for your testimony. Uh, it's, it's received. And Kalima, we can move on to the next uh, person. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Aisha Taylor. Time starts now. Hello. Um, I would like to first thank Deputy Chancellor Sean Robson for being a true leader of this work from the Community Re Renewal Schools team with Dr. Karen Mapp to working tirelessly to create equitable, cultural, relevant, and student-centered community-centered um, schools. I would like to thank Chair Traeger, um, NYC council members, and my fellow community education council members as well. My name is Aisha Taylor, and I'm a service disabled combat veteran and an elected member of the community education council for District 10 in the Bronx. Uh, un I unapologetically advocate and amplify the parent voice of over 55,000 students, of which 13,000 are students in shelter and temporary housing. Yes, we parents want our children back in school, but not without adequate resources, not without a student-centered virtual learning experience, not without nurses and social workers. It seems that we are a tale of five micro ecosystems under one governance without a unified system. It seems that the local city and state officials have declared psychological warfare on its most vulnerable people who are impacted by numerous intersectional pieces of an already underserved, underfunded community. We, you are literally telling our most norm, marginalized and silenced voices that they are not even worth um, having their basic needs met. To just listen as you speak and bark orders or pass down instructions and do what you're told. The voices of parents and students continue to go unheard. Even the elected parent leaders sworn in and governed by New York State education law are not allowed access to schools or provided the data that you, are, you all are asking for. You know, um, our, your political titles and positions matter more than the actual people that you were elected and positioned to serve. We are your constituents and we are more than a number. This data that you all are using and uh, quoting and sharing throughout the DOE, it's most definitely flawed and it's manipulated to promote the agenda of DOE. Parents need language access and documents free from DOE jargon and workshops free from DOE jargon, we are tired of, tired of it. We don't wanna hear anything else. We are boots to ground in the streets at our schools, okay? And we don't need your permission at this point. We know what's happening in our schools. We know what's happening. If we were elected to give advice to the DOE, to the chancellor, why not hear our voices? The students have been speaking loud and clear Time has and we expired. Have, we've been dismissed we have been marching we have been advocating we have been lobbying we have been doing everything that we need to do we have given you multiple plans of how to make this work we requested for the schools to not open until you all had a plan and provided multiple plans and yet the DOE decided to do whatever it wanted to do because you all are so concerned about this talking point of being the first in the world to open up. That makes no sense. Look how many lives we've lost. Look how many students that we're losing that somebody mentioned a year, but this is generationally gonna take a few years for our students to catch up. And they were already behind. They were already underfunded. They were already under, you know, resource. Like, why are we still having these conversations? People are dying. This is a real thing. You have declared war on our students. And I saw some of you smile today. And this is not a smiling thing. This is a real thing. People are losing their lives, their livelihoods, everything that they've worked for. If you are a small business owner, you are losing that. And then you're losing your children sitting here watching. I've been watching my children slowly die in front of a damn computer screen for eight hours. And excuse me, but this is real. Eight plus hours sitting in front of a computer screen how could you do that? How can, and we need to be honest about these issues and what's truly happening in our communities. We are tired, especially in the Bronx, one district, 55,000 students, 13,000 of them are in shelter and temporary housing. And we're guessing, and you guys are talking about five weeks for 60,000 devices. We have 1.1 million students. 
I almost have 55,000 in my district. So you're coming with 60,000 devices when we already told you March that we were gonna need more devices. But we're tired of this. No more politics, no more power lying, no more placing profits and position over our children, over the people, over our communities. We're tired. And we just ask that you take us, we are very capable of doing this work. We don't need anybody else to come in and decide for us, somebody who has multiple degrees and most, multiple positions. We don't need anyone else to come in and serve our community the way that we already have been. So hear us actively, hear us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Nigel Howard. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Nigel. So hello, everyone. My name is Nisha Howard. I want to thank the Committee on Education for taking the time to listen to my testimony. I'm here today to, dis to discuss the issue of food insecurity and food waste coming from our school cafeterias. Growing up, I was a student in the public school system from kindergarten to 12th grade. Just like many children who attended public schools, I ate breakfast and lunch provided in my school cafeteria. During my time attending these institutions, I've seen firsthand the amount of food that goes to waste. My classmates and I would oftentimes eat all that was, wouldn't eat all that was given to us on our lunch trays. Milk, veggies, fruit, pizza, or any other item we did not have enough time to finish or just chose not to eat would go to waste. Data collected regarding food waste shows that approximately 53,000 tons of food waste come from our school cafeterias. Keep in mind these numbers were collected pre-COVID. These numbers cannot be ignored considering roughly 12.8% of New York City residents experience food insecurity and wonder when they will eat their next meal. And 1.4 million New Yorkers rely on emergency food services annually. These services provide um, these services provide food for one in five senior citizens and children um, that rely on food pantries and soup kitchens. These numbers are only expected to increase with school closures and escalating rates of unemployment during the pandemic. These numbers cannot be ignored and make me question why we're not using the resources we already have to address a problem that so many of our communities are facing. This is why I'm calling for the passage of Local Law 0802-2018. This bill was assigned to the Education Committee and proposed by Jumani Williams. This law would require the Department of Education to donate unconsumed meals to food bank organizations that provide free meals to New Yorkers in need. With that said, I'm asking for the council members on this call to vote in favor of the passage of this bill. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you to that panel. If any um, council members have any questions for this panel, just um, please raise your hand by using the Zoom raise your hand function. Thank you. That was the last um, the last panel. But if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing none, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I will now turn it back to Chair Traeger for some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Kalima, uh, for, for your help and service and for all council staff. It's been very helpful, appreciate it. Uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, yesterday and uh, we have to act with a sense of uh, crisis urgency. Um, and as many of the folks have rightfully said on this call, um, these are issues that have been raised months ago. To me, there is no excuse why every, why every child is still, does not have a device in their hands right now. Um, when principals I know put in these requests months ago. Um, and protocols need to be in place and applied in terms of responding to kids in crisis, mental health crisis, we didn't 
get into the fact that the number of kids I've heard anecdotally, but again, there's no data out there right now, but anecdotally I'm hearing about kids uh, with suicide ideation cases that schools have to respond to. Um, I, that has come up during the course of some calls. Um, but I just want to uh, note that any, any folks watching or uh, listening to the Zoom, if there's a particular school community, student, family, that's in need of help, please email me as well, mtrigger at council at mmc.gov. I took some notes to follow up on here today as well. Um, this is work that we take very, very personal. Uh, these are our kids. And uh, we're, we're going to continue to keep up the fight to demand accountability, transparency, and to prioritize services, in-person services, for the children who absolutely need, need it the most in a phased in approach. And I will continue to hold the mayor's feet to the fire. And with that, I appreciate everyone's time today, uh, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.